Book One, Chapter One of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Life of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter One showing the wholesome uses drawn from recording the achievements of those wonderful productions of nature called great men. As it is necessary that all great and surprising events, the design of which are laid, conducted and brought to perfection by the utmost force of human invention and art, should be produced by great and eminent men. So the lives of such may be justly and properly styled quintessence of history. In these, when delivered to us by sensible writers, we are not only most agreeably entertained, but most usefully instructed. For, besides the attaining, hence, a consummate knowledge of human nature in general, of its secret springs, various windings and perplexed mazes, we have here before our eyes lively examples of whatever is amiable or detestable, worthy of admiration or abhorrence, and are consequently taught in a manner infinitely more effectual than by precept, what we are eagerly to imitate or carefully to avoid. But besides the two obvious advantages of surveying, as it were, in a picture, the true beauty of virtue and deformity of vice, we may moreover learn from Plutarch, Nepos, Seotonius, and other biographers this useful lesson, not too hastily, nor in the gross, to bestow either our praise or censure, since we shall often find such a mixture of good and evil in the same character, that it may require a very accurate judgment and a very elaborate inquiry to determine on which side the balance turns. For, though we sometimes meet with an Aristides or a Brutus, a Lysander, or a Nero. Yet far the greater number are of the mixed kind, neither totally good nor bad, their greatest virtues being obscured and allayed by their vices, and those again softened and colored over by their virtues. Of this kind was the illustrious person whose history we now undertake to whom, though nature had given the greatest and most shining endowments, she had not given them absolutely pure and without allay. Though he had much of the admirable in his character, as much perhaps as is usually to be found in a hero, I will not yet venture to affirm that he was entirely free from all defects, or that the sharp eyes of censure could not spy out some little blemishes lurking amongst his many great perfections. We would not, therefore, be understood to affect giving the reader a perfect or consummate pattern of human excellence, but rather by faithfully recording some little imperfections which shadowed over the luster of those great qualities which we shall here record, to teach the lesson we have above mentioned, to induce our reader with us to lament the frailty of human nature, and to convince him that no mortal, after a thorough scrutiny, can be a proper object of our admiration. But before we enter on this great work, we must endeavor to remove some errors of opinion which mankind have, by the disingenuity 
of writers contracted. For these, from their fear of contradicting the absolute and absurd doctrines of a set of simple fellows, called, in derision, sages or philosophers, have endeavoured, as much as possible, to confound the ideas of greatness and goodness, whereas no two things can possibly be more distinct from each other, for greatness consists in bringing all manner of mischief on mankind, and goodness in removing it from them. It seems, therefore, very unlikely that the same person should possess them both, and yet nothing is more usual with writers, who find many instances of greatness in their favourite hero, than to make him a compliment of goodness into the bargain, and this without considering that, by such means, they destroy the great perfection called uniformity of character. In the histories of Alexander and Caesar, we are frequently, and indeed impertinently, reminded of their benevolence and generosity, of their clemency and kindness, when the former had with fire and sword overrun a vast empire, had destroyed the lives of an immense number of innocent wretches, had scattered ruin and desolation like a whirlwind. We are told, as an example of his clemency, that he did not cut the throat of an old woman, and ravish her daughters, but was content with only undoing them. And when the mighty Caesar with wonderful greatness of mind, had destroyed the liberties of his country, and with all the means of fraud and force had placed himself at the head of his equals, had corrupted and enslaved the greatest people whom the sun ever saw. We are reminded, as an evidence of his generosity, of his largesses to his followers and tools, by whose means he had accomplished his purpose, and by whose assistance he was to establish it. Now, who does not see that such sneaking qualities as these are rather to be bewailed as imperfections than admired as ornaments in these great men, rather obscuring their glory and holding them back in their race to greatness? indeed unworthy the end for which they seem to have come into the world, viz. of perpetrating vast and mighty mischief. We hope our reader will have reason justly to acquit us of any such confounding ideas in the following pages, in which, as we are to record the actions of a great man, so we have nowhere mentioned any spark of goodness which had discovered itself either faintly in him, or more glaringly in any other person, but as a meanness and imperfection, disqualifying them for undertakings which lead to honour and esteem among men. As our hero had as little as perhaps is to be found of that meanness indeed only enough to make him partaker of the imperfection of humanity, instead of the perfection of diabolism, we have ventured to call him the great. Nor do we doubt, but our reader, when he hath perused his story, will concur with us in allowing him that title. End of Book One, Chapter One, read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Book One, Chapter Two, of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Recording by Dennis Sayers. The History of the Life of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wild, The Great by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Two, giving an account of as many of our hero's ancestors as can be gathered out of the rubbish of antiquity, which hath been carefully sifted for that purpose. It is the custom of all biographers, at their entrance into their work, to step a little backwards, as far, indeed, generally as they are able, and to trace up their hero, as the ancients did the river Nile, till an incapacity of proceeding higher puts an end to their search. What first gave rise to this method is somewhat difficult to determine. Sometimes I have thought that the hero's ancestors have been introduced as foils to himself. Again, I have imagined it might be to obviate a suspicion that such extraordinary personages were not produced in the ordinary course of nature, and may have proceeded from the author's fear that, if we were not told who their fathers were, they might be in danger, like Prince Pretty Man, of being supposed to have had none. Lastly, and perhaps more truly, I have conjectured that the design of the biographer hath been no more than to show his great learning and knowledge of antiquity, a design to which the world hath probably owed many notable discoveries, and indeed most of the labours of our antiquarians. But whatever original this custom had, it is now too well established to be disputed. I shall therefore conform to it in the strictest manner. Mr. Jonathan W.I.L.D., or W.Y.L.D., then, for he himself did not always agree in one method of spelling his name, was descended from the great Wolfstan Wilde, who came over with Hengist, and distinguished himself very eminently at that famous festival, where the Britons were so treacherously murdered by the Saxons. For when the word was given, that is, Emmet, Aeor Saxes, take out your swords, this gentleman, being a little hard of hearing, mistook the sound for Nemet, her sacks, take out their purses. Instead, therefore, of applying to the throat, he immediately applied to the pocket of his guest, and contented himself with taking all that he had, without attempting his life. The next ancestor of our hero, who was remarkably eminent, was Wild, surnamed Langfanger, or Longfinger. He flourished in the reign of Henry the Third, and was strictly attached to Hubert de Burgh, whose friendship he was recommended to by his great excellence, in an art of which Hubert was himself the inventor. He could, without the knowledge of the proprietor, with great ease and dexterity, draw forth a man's purse from any part of his garment where it was deposited, and hence he derived his surname. This gentleman was the first of his family who had the honor to suffer for the good of his country, on whom a wit of that time made the following epitaph, O oh, shame, O oh justice! Wild is hanged, for thatten he a pocket fanged, while safe old Hubert and his gang doth pocket o the nation fang. Lanfanger left a son named Edward, whom he had certainly instructed in the art for which he himself was so famous. This Edward had a grandson, who served as a volunteer under the famous Sir John Falstaff, and by his gallant demeanour so recommended himself to his captain that he would have certainly been promoted by him had Henry V kept his word with his old companion. After the death of Edward, the family remained in some obscurity down to the reign of Charles I, when James Wilde, distinguishing himself on both sides the question in the civil wars, 
passing from one to t'other, as heaven seemed to declare itself in favor of either party. At the end of the war, James not being rewarded according to his merits, as is usually the case of such impartial persons, he associated himself with a brave man of those times, whose name was Hind, and declared open war with both parties. He was successful in several actions, and spoiled many of the enemy, till, at length, being overpowered and taken, he was, contrary to the law of arms, put basely and cowardly to death, by a combination between twelve men of the enemy's party, who, after some consultation, unanimously agreed on the said murder. This Edward took to wife Rebecca, the daughter of the above-mentioned John Hind, Esquire, by whom he had issue John, Edward, Thomas, and Jonathan, and three daughters, namely Grace, Charity, and Honor. John followed the fortunes of his father, and, suffering with him, left no issue. Edward was so remarkable for his compassionate temper that he spent his life in soliciting the causes of the distressed captives in Newgate, and is reported to have held a strict friendship with an eminent divine who solicited the spiritual causes of the said captives. He married Editha, daughter and co-heiress of Geoffrey Snap, gentleman, who long enjoyed an office under the High Sheriff of London and Middlesex, by which, with great reputation, he acquired a handsome fortune. By her he had no issue. Thomas went very young abroad to one of our American colonies, and hath not been since heard of. As for the daughters, Grace was married to a merchant of Yorkshire, who dealt in horses. Charity took to husband an eminent gentleman, whose name I cannot learn, but who was famous for so friendly a disposition that he was bail for above a hundred persons in one year. He had likewise the remarkable humor of walking in Westminster Hall with a straw in his shoe. Honor, the youngest, died unmarried. She lived many years in this town, was a great frequenter of plays, and used to be remarkable for distributing oranges to all who would accept of them. Jonathan married Elizabeth, daughter of Scrag Hollow, of Hockley in the Hole, Esquire, and by her had Jonathan, who is the illustrious subject of these memoirs. End of Book 1, Chapter 2 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Book 1, Chapter 2 of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, the Great This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Dennis Sayers. The History of the Life of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, the Great, by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Three The Birth, Parentage, and Education of Mr. Jonathan Wilde, the Great. It is observable that nature seldom produces any one who is afterwards to act a notable part on the stage of life but she gives some warning of her intention, and, as the dramatic poet generally prepares the entry of every considerable character with a solemn narrative, or at least a great flourish of drums and trumpets, so doth this our alma mater, by some shrewd hints, pre-admonish us of her intention, giving us warning, as it were, and crying, Vignetti! Ocurite morbo. Thus, Estyges, who was the grandfather of Cyrus, dreamt that his daughter 
was brought to bed of a vine, whose branches overspread all Asia, and Hecuba, while big with Paris, dreamt that she was delivered of a firebrand that set all Troy in flames. So did the mother of our great man, while she was with child of him, dream that she was enjoyed in the night by the gods Mercury and Priapus. This dream puzzled all the learned astrologers of her time, seeming to imply in it a contradiction, Mercury being the god of ingenuity, and Priapus the uh, terror of those who practiced it. What made this dream more powerful, and perhaps the true cause of its being remembered, was a very extraordinary circumstance, sufficiently denoting something preternatural in it, for though she had never heard even the name of either of these gods, she repeated these very words in the morning, which only a small mistake of the quantity of the latter, which she chose to call Priapus instead of Priapus, and her husband swore that, though he might possibly have named Mercury to her, for he had heard of such an heathen god, he never in his life could anywise have put her in mind of that other deity with whom he had no acquaintance. Another remarkable incident was that during her whole pregnancy she constantly longed for everything she saw, nor could be satisfied with her wish unless she enjoyed it clandestinely, and as nature, by true and accurate observers, is remarked to give us no appetites without furnishing us with the means of gratifying them, so had she at this time a most marvellous glutinous quality attending her fingers, to which, as to bird-lime, everything closely adhered that she handled. To omit other stories, some of which may be perhaps the growth of superstition, we proceed to the birth of our hero, who made his first appearance on this great theatre the very day when the plague first broke out in 1665. Some say his mother was delivered of him in an house of an orbicular, or round form, in Covent Garden, but of this we are not certain. He was some years afterwards baptized by the famous Mr. Titus Oates. Nothing very remarkable passed in his years of infancy, save that as the letters TH are the most difficult of pronunciation, and the last which a child attains to the utterance of, so they were the first that came with any readiness from young Master Wilde. Nor must we omit the early indications which he gave of the sweetness of his temper, for though he was by no means to be terrified into compliance, yet might he, by a sugar-plum, be brought to your purpose. Indeed, to say the truth, he was to be bribed to anything, which made many say he was certainly born to be a great man. He was scarce settled at school, before he gave marks of his lofty and aspiring temper, and was regarded by all his schoolfellows with that deference which men generally pay to those superior geniuses who will exact it of them. If an orchard was to be robbed, Wilde was consulted, and though he was himself seldom concerned in the execution of the design, yet was he always concerter of it, and treasurer of the booty, some little part of which he would now and then, with wonderful generosity, bestow on those who took it. He was generally very secret on these occasions, but if any offered to plunder of his own head, without acquainting Master Wilde, and making a deposit of the booty, he was sure to have information against him lodged with the schoolmaster, and to be severely punished for his pains. He discovered so little attention to school learning, that his master, who was a very wise and worthy man, soon gave over all care and trouble on that account, 
and acquainting his parents that their son proceeded extremely well in his studies, he permitted his pupil to follow his own inclinations, perceiving they led him to nobler pursuits than the sciences, which are generally acknowledged to be a very unprofitable study, and indeed greatly to hinder the advancement of men in the world. But though Master Wilde was not esteemed the readiest at making his exercise, he was universally allowed to be the most dexterous at stealing it of all his schoolfellows, being never detected in such furtive compositions, nor in any other exercitations of his great talents, which all inclined the same way. But once, when he had laid violent hands on a book called Gratus Ad Parnassum, that is, a step towards Parnassus, on which account his master, who was a man of most wonderful wit and sagacity, is said to have told him he wished it might not prove, in the event, Gratus Ad Patibulum, that is, a step towards the gallows. But although he would not give himself the pains requisite to acquire a competent sufficiency in the learned languages, yet did he readily listen with attention to others, especially when they translated the classical authors to him, nor was he in the least backward at all such times to express his approbation. He was wonderfully pleased with the passage in the eleventh Iliad, where Achilles is said to have bound two sons of Priam upon a mountain, and afterwards to have released them for a sum of money. This was, he said, alone sufficient to refute those who affected a contempt for the wisdom of the ancients, and an undeniable testimony of the great antiquity of Prigism. Footnote. This word, in the Cant language, signifies thievery. He was ravished with the account which Nestor gives in the same book of the rich booty which he bore off, that is, stole, from the Elians. He was desirous of having this often repeated to him, and at the end of every repetition he constantly fetched a deep sigh, and said it was a glorious booty. When the story of Cacus was read to him out of the eighth Aeneid, he generously pitied the unhappy fate of that great man, to whom he thought Hercules much too severe. One of his schoolfellows commended the dexterity of drawing the oxen backward by their tails into his den. He smiled, and with some disdain said, He could have taught him a better way. He was a passionate admirer of heroes, particularly of Alexander the Great, between whom and the late King of Sweden he would frequently draw parallels. He was much delighted with the accounts of the Tsar's retreat from the latter, who carried off the inhabitants of great cities to people his own country. This, he said, was not once thought of by Alexander, but, added, perhaps he did not want them. Happy had it been for him, if he had confined himself to this sphere, but his chief, if not only blemish, was that he would sometimes, from an humility in his nature too pernicious to true greatness, condescend to an intimacy with inferior things and persons. Thus the Spanish rogue was his favorite book, and the cheats of Scapin his favorite play. The young gentleman being now at the age of seventeen, his father, from a foolish prejudice to our universities, and out of a false as well as excessive regard to his morals, brought his son to town, where he resided with him till he was of an age to travel. Whilst he was here, all imaginable care was taken of his instruction, his father endeavouring his utmost to inculcate principles of honour 
and gentility into his son. End of Book 1, Chapter 3 Read by Dennis Sayers For LibriVox in Modesto, California Book 1, Chapter 4 Of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great by Daniel Defoe. Book One, Chapter Four. Mr. Wilde's First Entrance into the World. His Acquaintance with Count Larousse. An accident soon happened after his arrival in town, which almost saved the father his whole labor on this head, and provided Master Wild a better tutor than any aftercare or expense could have furnished him with. The old gentleman, it seems, was a follower of the fortunes of Mr. Snap, son of Mr. Geoffrey Snap, whom we have before mentioned, to have enjoyed a reputable office under the Sheriff of London and Middlesex, the daughter of which Geoffrey had intermarried with the Wilds. Mr. Snap, the younger, being thereto well warranted, had laid violent hands on, or, as the vulgar express it, arrested one Count Larousse, a man of considerable figure in those days, and had confined him to his own house till he could find two seconds who would in a formal manner give their words that the Count should at a certain day and place appointed, answer all that one Thomas Thimble, a tailor, had to say to him, which Thomas Thimble, it seems, alleged that the Count had, according to the law of the realm, made over his body to him as a security for some suits of clothes, to him delivered by the said Thomas Thimble. Now, as the Count, though perfectly a man of honour, could not immediately find the seconds, he was obliged for some time to reside at Mr. Snap's house. For it seems the law of the land is that whoever owes another ten pounds, or indeed two pounds, may be, on the oath of that person, immediately taken up and carried away from his own house and family, and kept abroad till he is made to owe fifty pounds whether he will or no, for which he is perhaps afterwards obliged to lie in jail. And all these without any trial had, or any evidence of the debt, than the above said oath, which, if untrue, as it often happens, you have no remedy against the perjurer. He was, forsooth, mistaken. But though Mr. Snap would not, as perhaps by the nice rules of honour he was obliged, discharge the Count on his parole, yet did he not, as by the strict rules of law he was enabled, confine him to his chamber. The Count had his liberty of the whole house, and Mr. Snap, using only the precaution of keeping his doors well locked and barred, took his prisoner's word that he would not go forth. Mr. Snap had, by his second lady, two daughters, who were now in the bloom of their youth and beauty. These young ladies, like damsels in romance, compassionated the captive count, and endeavoured by all means to make his confinement less irksome to him which, though they were both very beautiful, they could not attain by any other way so effectually as by engaging with him at cards, in which contentions, as will appear hereafter, the Count was greatly skilful. As whisk and swabbers was the game then in the chief vogue, they were obliged to look for a fourth person in order to make up their parties. Mr. Snap himself 
would sometimes relax his mind from the violent fatigues of his employment by these recreations, and sometimes a neighboring young gentleman or lady came in to their assistance. But the most frequent guest was young Master Wilde, who had been educated from his infancy with the Miss Snaps, and was by all the neighbors allotted for the husband of Miss Tishy, or Letitia, the younger of the two. For though, being his cousin German, she was perhaps in the eye of a strict conscience, somewhat too nearly related to him, yet the old people on both sides though sufficiently scrupulous in nice matters, agreed to overlook this objection. Men of great genius as easily discover one another as Freemasons can. It was therefore no wonder that the Count soon conceived an inclination to an intimacy with our young hero, whose vast abilities could not be concealed from one of the Count's discernment for though this latter was so expert at his cards that he was proverbially said to play the whole game, he was no match for Master Wilde, who, inexperienced as he was, notwithstanding all the art, the dexterity, and often the fortune of his adversary, never failed to send him away from the table with less in his pocket than he brought to it, for, indeed, Langfanger himself could not have extracted a purse with more ingenuity than our young hero. His hands made frequent visits to the Count's pocket, before the latter had entertained any suspicion of him, imputing the several losses he sustained rather to the innocent and sprightly frolic of Miss Doshi, or Theodosia, with which as she indulged him with little innocent freedoms about her person in return, he thought himself obliged to be contented. But one night, when Wilde imagined the Count asleep, he made so unguarded an attack upon him that the other caught him in the fact. However, he did not think proper to acquaint him with the discovery he had made, but preventing him from any booty at that time, he only took care for the future to button his pockets, and to pack the cards with double industry. So far was this detection from causing any quarrel between these two prigs, footnote, thieves, that in reality it recommended them to each other. For a wise man, that is to say a rogue, considers a trick in life, as a gamester doth a trick at play. It sets him on his guard, but he admires the dexterity of him who plays it. These, therefore, and many other such instances of ingenuity, operated so violently on the Count, that notwithstanding the disparity which age, title, and, above all, dress, had set between them, he resolved to enter into an acquaintance with Wilde. This soon produced a perfect intimacy, and that a friendship, which had a longer duration than is common to that passion between persons who only propose to themselves the common advantages of eating, drinking, whoring, or borrowing money, which ends as they soon fail, so doth the friendship founded upon them. Mutual interest, the greatest of all purposes, was the cement of this alliance, which nothing of consequence but superior interest was capable of dissolving. End of Book One, Chapter Four, read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California. For LibriVox. Book One, Chapter Five 
of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Five. A dialogue between young Master Wilde and Count La Russe, which, having extended to the rejoinder, had a very quiet, easy, and natural conclusion. One evening, after the Miss Snaps were retired to rest, the Count thus addressed himself to the young Wilde. You cannot, I apprehend, Mr. Wilde, be such a stranger to your own great capacity, as to be surprised when I tell you I have often viewed, with a mixture of astonishment and concern, your shining qualities confined to a sphere where they can never reach the eyes of those who would introduce them properly into the world, and raise you to an eminence where you may blaze out to the admiration of all men. I assure you I am pleased with my captivity when I reflect I am likely to owe to it an acquaintance, and I hope, friendship, with the greatest genius of my age, and what is still more, when I indulge my vanity with a prospect of drawing from obscurity, pardon the expression, such talents as were, I believe, never before like to have been buried in it. For I make no question but, at my discharge from confinement, which will now soon happen, I shall be able to introduce you into company where you may reap the advantage of your superior parts. I will bring you acquainted, sir, with those who, as they are capable of setting a true value on such qualifications, so they will have it both in their power and inclination to prefer you for them. Such an introduction is the only advantage you want, without which your merit might be your misfortune, for those abilities which would entitle you to honour and profit in a superior station may render you only obnoxious to danger and disgrace in a lower. Mr. Wilde answered, Sir, I am not insensible of my obligations to you, as well for the overvalue you have set on my small abilities, as for the kindness you express in offering to introduce me among my superiors. I must own, my father hath often persuaded me to push myself into the company of my betters. But, to say the truth, I have an awkward pride in my nature, which is better pleased with being at the head of the lowest class than at the bottom of the highest. Permit me to say, though the idea may be somewhat coarse, I had rather stand on the summit of a dunghill than at the bottom of a hill in paradise. I have always thought it signifies little into what rank of life I am thrown, provided I make a great figure therein, and should be as well satisfied with exerting my talents well at the head of a small party or gang as in the command of a mighty army. For I am far from agreeing with you that great parts are often lost in a low situation. On the contrary, I am convinced it is impossible that they should be lost. I have often persuaded myself that there were not fewer than a thousand in Alexander's troops capable of performing what Alexander himself did. But because such spirits were not elected or destined to an imperial command, are we therefore to imagine they came off without a booty? or that they contented themselves with the share in common with their comrades? Surely, no. In civil life, doubtless, the same genius, the same endowments, have often composed the statesman and the prig. 
for so we call what the vulgar name a thief. The same parts, the same actions, often promote men to the head of superior societies, which raise them to the head of lower. And where is the essential difference, if the one ends on Tower Hill, and the other at Tyburn? Hath the block any preference to the gallows, or the axe to the halter, but was given them by the ill-guided judgment of men? You will pardon me, therefore, if I am not so hastily inflamed with the common outside of things, nor join the general opinion in preferring one state to another. A guinea is as valuable in a leathern as in an embroidered purse, and a cod's head is a cod's head still, whether in a pewter or a silver dish. The Count replied as follows. What you have now said doth not lessen my idea of your capacity, but confirms my opinion of the ill effect of bad and low company. Can any man doubt whether it is better to be a great statesman or a common thief? I have often heard that the devil used to say, where or to whom I know not, that it was better to reign in hell than to be a valet de chambre in heaven. And perhaps he was in the right. But sure, if he had had the choice of reigning in either, he would have chosen better. The truth, therefore, is, that by low conversation we contract a greater awe for high things than they deserve. We decline great pursuits, not from contempt, but despair. The man who prefers the high road to a more reputable way of making his fortune, doth it because he imagines the one easier than the other. But you yourself have asserted, and with undoubted truth, that the same abilities qualify you for undertaking, and the same means will bring you to your end in both journeys. As in music, it is the same tune whether they play it in a higher or a lower key. To instance, in some particulars, is it not the same qualification which enables this man to hire himself as a servant, and to get into the confidence and secrets of his master in order to rob him, and that to undertake trusts of the highest nature with a design to break and betray them? Is it less difficult, by false tokens, to deceive a shopkeeper into the delivery of his goods, which you afterwards run away with, than to impose upon him, by outward splendor and the appearance of fortune, into a credit by which you gain, and he loses twenty times as much? Doth it not require more dexterity in the fingers to draw out a man's purse from his pocket, or to take a lady's watch from her side, without being perceived of any, an excellence in which, without flattery, I am persuaded you have no superior, than to cog a die, or to shuffle a pack of cards, is not as much art as many excellent qualities required to make a pimping porter at a common body-house as would enable a man to prostitute his own or his friend's wife or child. Doth it not ask as good a memory as nimble an invention, as steady a countenance, to forswear yourself in Westminster Hall, as would furnish out a complete tool of state, and perhaps a statesman himself. It is needless to particularize every instance. In all we shall find that there is a nearer connection between high and low life 
than is generally imagined, and that a highwayman is entitled to more favour with the great than he usually meets with. If therefore, as I think I have proved, the same parts which qualify a man for eminence in a low sphere, qualify him likewise for eminence in a higher, sure it can be no doubt in which he would choose to exert them. Ambition, without which no one can be a great man, will immediately instruct him, in your own phrase, to prefer a hill in paradise to a dunghill, nay, even fear, a passion the most repugnant to greatness, will show him how much more safely he may indulge himself in the free and full exertion of his mighty abilities in the higher than in the lower rank. Since experience teaches him that there is a crowd oftener in one year at Tyburn than on Tower Hill in a century. Mr. Wilde, with much solemnity, rejoined, that the same capacity which qualifies a milken, footnote, a housebreaker, a bridal cull, footnote, a highwayman, or a buttock and file, footnote, a shoplifter, terms used in the Cant Dictionary, to arrive at any degree of eminence in his profession, would likewise raise a man in what the world esteem a more honourable calling, I do not deny. Nay, in many of your instances it is evident that more ingenuity, more art, are necessary to the lower than the higher proficience. If, therefore, you had only contended that every prig might be a statesman, if he pleased, I had readily agreed to it, but when you conclude that it is his interest to be so, that ambition would bid him take that alternative, in a word, that a statesman is greater or happier than a prig. I must deny my assent. But in comparing these two together, we must carefully avoid being misled by the vulgar, erroneous estimation of things, for mankind err in disquisitions of this nature, as physicians do, who in considering the operations of a disease, have not a due regard to the age and complexion of the patient. The same degree of heat which is common in this constitution may be a fever in that. In the same manner, that which may be riches or honour to me may be poverty or disgrace to another. For all these things are to be estimated by relation to the person who possesses them. A bounty of ten pounds looks as great in the eye of a bridal cull, and gives as much happiness to his fancy as that of as many thousands to the statesman, and doth not the former lay out his acquisitions in whores and fiddles, with much greater joy and mirth than the latter in palaces and pictures. What are the flattery, the false compliments of his gang, to the statesman, when he himself must condemn his own blunders, and is obliged, against his will, to give fortune the whole honour of success? What is the pride resulting from such sham applause compared to the secret satisfaction which a prig enjoys in his mind in reflecting on a well-contrived and well-executed scheme? Perhaps, indeed, the greater danger is on the prig's side, but then you must remember that the greater honour is so too. When I mention honour, I mean that which is paid them by their gang, for that weak part of the world which is vulgarly called the wise, see both in a disadvantageous and disgraceful light, 
and, as the prig enjoys, and merits, too, the greater degree of honour from his gang, so doth he suffer the less disgrace from the world, who think his misdeeds, as they call them, sufficiently at last punished with a halter, which at once puts an end to his pain and infamy, whereas the other is not only hated in power, but detested and contemned at the scaffold, and future ages vent their malice on his fame, while the other sleeps quiet and forgotten. Besides, let us a little consider the secret quiet of their consciences. How easy is the reflection of having taken a few shillings or pounds from a stranger without any breach of confidence, or perhaps any great harm to the person who loses it, compared to that of having betrayed a public trust, and ruined the fortunes of thousands, perhaps of a great nation. How much braver is an attack on the highway than at a gaming table, and how much more innocent the character of a B blank blank D Y house than a C blank blank T pimp. He was eagerly proceeding, when, casting his eyes on the count, he perceived him to be fast asleep. Wherefore, having first picked his pocket of three shillings, then gently jogged him in order to take his leave, and promised to return to him the next morning to breakfast, they separated. The Count retired to rest, and Master Wilde to a night cellar. End of Part 1, Chapter 5 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Book 1, Chapter 6 Of The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great by Henry Fielding Book One, Chapter Six Further Conferences Between the Count and Master Wilde With Other Matters of the Great Kind The Count missed his money the next morning and very well knew who had it, but as he knew likewise how fruitless would be any complaint, he chose to pass it by without mentioning it. Indeed, it may appear strange to some readers that these gentlemen, who knew each other to be thieves, should never once give the least hint of this knowledge in all their discourse together, but, on the contrary, should have the words honesty, honour, and friendship as often in their mouths as any other men. This, I say, may appear strange to some, but those who have lived long in cities, courts, jails, or such places, will perhaps be able to solve the seeming absurdity. When our two friends met the next morning, the Count who, though he did not agree with the whole of his friend's doctrine, was, however, highly pleased with his argument, began to bewail the misfortune of his captivity, and the backwardness of friends to assist each other in their necessities. But what vexed him, he said, most was the cruelty of the fair, for he entrusted Wilde, with the secret of his having had an intrigue with Miss Theodosia, the elder of the Miss Snaps, ever since his confinement, though he could not prevail with her to set him at liberty. 
Wild answered, with a smile, It is no wonder a woman should wish to confine her lover, where she might be sure of having him entirely to herself. But, added, he believed he could tell him a method of certainly procuring his escape. The Count eagerly besought him to acquaint him with it. Wild told him bribery was the surest means, and advised him to apply to the maid. The Count thanked him, but returned that he had not a farthing left besides one guinea, which he had then given her to change. To which Wilde said, he must make it up with promises, which he supposed he was courtier enough to know how to put off. The Count greatly applauded the advice, and said he hoped he should be able in time to persuade him to condescend to be a great man, for which he was so perfectly well qualified. This method being concluded on, the two friends sat down to cards, a circumstance which I should not have mentioned but for the sake of observing the prodigious force of habit, for though the Count knew if he won ever so much of Mr. Wilde, he should not receive a shilling, yet could he not refrain from packing the cards, nor could Wilde keep his hands out of his friend's pockets though he knew there was nothing in them. When the maid came home, the Count began to put it to her, offered her all he had, and promised mountains in futuro. But all in vain, the maid's honesty was impregnable. She said she would not break her trust for the whole world, no, not if she could gain a hundred pound by it. Upon which Wilde, stepping up, and telling her she need not fear losing her place, for it would never be found out, that they could throw a pair of sheets into the street, by which it might appear he got out at the window, that he himself would swear he saw him descending, that the money would be so much gains in her pocket, that Besides his promises, which she might depend on being performed, she would receive from him twenty shillings and ninepence in ready money, for she had only laid out threepence in plain Spanish, and, lastly, that, besides his honour, the Count should leave a pair of gold buttons, which afterwards turned out to be brass, of great value in her hands, as a further pawn. The maid still remained inflexible, till Wilde offered to lend his friend a guinea more, and to deposit it immediately in her hands. This reinforcement bore down the poor girl's resolution, and she faithfully promised to open the door to the Count that evening. Thus did our young hero not only lend his rhetoric, which few people care to do without a fee, but his money, too, a sum which many a good man would have made fifty excuses before he would have parted with, to his friend, and procured him his liberty. But it would be highly derogatory from the great character of Wilde, should the reader imagine he lent such a sum to a friend without the least view of serving himself, as, therefore, the reader may easily account for it in a manner more advantageous to our hero's reputation by concluding that he had some interested view in the Count's enlargement, we hope he will judge with charity, especially as the sequel makes it not only reasonable, but necessary to suppose he had some such view. A long intimacy and friendship subsisted between the Count and Mr. Wilde, who, being by the advice of the Count dressed in good clothes, was by him 
introduced into the best company. They constantly frequented the assemblies, auctions, gaming tables, and playhouses, at which last they saw two acts every night, and then retired without paying, this being, it seems, an immemorial privilege which the bows of the town prescribed for themselves. This, however, did not suit Wilde's temper, who called it a cheat, and objected against it as requiring no dexterity, but what every blockhead might put in execution. He said it was a custom very much savouring of the sneaking budge, footnote, shoplifting, but neither so honourable nor so ingenious. Wilde now made a considerable figure, and passed for a gentleman of great fortune in the funds. Women of quality treated him with great familiarity. Young ladies began to spread their charms for him, when an accident happened that put a stop to his continuance in a way of life too insipid and inactive to afford employment for those great talents which were designed to make a much more considerable figure in the world than attends the character of a beau or a pretty gentleman. End of Book 1, Chapter 6 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Book 1, Chapter 7 Of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Dennis Sayers The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great, by Henry Fielding Book One, Chapter Seven Master Wilde sets out on his travels and returns home again. A very short chapter containing infinitely more time and less matter than any other in the whole story. We are sorry we cannot indulge our reader's curiosity with a full and perfect account of this accident, but as there are such various accounts, one of which only can be true, and possibly, and indeed, probably none, instead of following the general method of historians, who in such cases set down the various reports, and leave to your own conjecture which you will choose, we shall pass them all over. Certain it is that, whatever this accident was, it determined our hero's father to send his son immediately abroad for seven years, and, which may seem somewhat remarkable, to his majesty's plantations in America, that part of the world being, as he said, freer from vices than the courts and cities of Europe, and consequently less dangerous to corrupt a young man's morals. And as for the advantages, the old gentleman thought they were equal there with those attained in the politer climates. For traveling, he said, was traveling in one part of the world as well as another. It consisted in being such a time from home, and in traversing so many leagues. And he appealed to experience whether most of our travellers in France and Italy did not prove at their return that they might have been sent as profitably to Norway and Greenland. According to these resolutions of his father, the young gentleman went aboard a ship and with a great deal of good company, set out for the American hemisphere. The exact time of his stay is somewhat uncertain, most probably longer than was intended. But howsoever long his abode there was, 
it must be a blank in this history, as the whole story contains not one adventure worthy the reader's notice, being, indeed, a continued scene of whoring, drinking, and removing from one place to another. To confess a truth, we are so ashamed of the shortness of this chapter, that we would have done a violence to our history, and have inserted an adventure or two of some other traveller, to which purpose we borrowed the journals of several young gentlemen who have lately made the tour of Europe, but to our great sorrow could not extract a single incident strong enough to justify the theft to our conscience. When we consider the ridiculous figure this chapter must make, being the history of no less than eight years, our only comfort is that the histories of some men's lives, and perhaps of some men who have made a noise in the world, are in reality as absolute blanks as the travels of our hero. As, therefore, we shall make sufficient amends in the sequel for this inanity, we shall hasten on to matters of true importance and immense greatness. At present we content ourselves with setting down our hero where we took him up after acquainting our reader that he went abroad, stayed seven years, and then came home again. End of Part 1, Chapter 7 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Book 1, Chapter 8 Of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Eight. An Adventure Where Wilde in the Division of the Booty Exhibits an Astonishing Instance of Greatness. The Count was one night very successful at the hazard table, where Wilde who was just returned from his travels, was then present, as was likewise a young gentleman whose name was Bob Bagshot, an acquaintance of Mr. Wilde's, and of whom he entertained a great opinion. Taking, therefore, Mr. Bagshot aside, he advised him to provide himself, if he had them not about him, with a case of pistols, and to attack the Count in his way home promising to plant himself near with the same arms as a corps de reserve, and to come up on occasion. This was accordingly executed, and the Count obliged to surrender to savage force what he had in so genteel and civil a manner taken at play. And, as it is a wise and philosophical observation that one misfortune never comes alone, the Count had hardly passed the examination of Mr. Bagshot when he fell into the hands of Mr. Snap, who, in company with Mr. Wilde the Elder, and one or two more gentlemen, being, it seems, thereto well warranted, laid hold of the unfortunate Count, and, conveyed him back to the same house from which, by the assistance of his good friend, he had formerly escaped. Mr. Wilde and Mr. Bagshot went together to the tavern, where Mr. Bagshot, generously as he thought, offered to share the booty, and, having divided the money into two unequal heaps, and added a golden snuff-box to the lesser heap, he desired Mr. Wilde to take his choice. 
Mr. Wild immediately conveyed the larger share of the ready into his pocket, according to an excellent maxim of his, first secure what share you can, before you wrangle for the rest. And then, turning to his companion, he asked with a stern countenance whether he intended to keep all that sum to himself. Mr. Bagshot answered, with some surprise, that he thought Mr. Wilde had no reason to complain, for it was surely fair, at least on his part, to content himself with an equal share of the booty who had taken the whole. I grant you took it, replied Wilde, but, pray, who proposed or counselled the taking it? Can you say that you have done more than executed my scheme? And might not I, if I had pleased, have employed another, since you well know there was not a gentleman in the room, but would have taken the money, if he had known how, conveniently and safely, to do it? That is very true, returned Bagshot, but did I not execute the scheme? Did not I run the whole risk? Should not I have suffered the whole punishment? if I had been taken, and is not the labourer worthy of his hire? Doubtless, says Jonathan, he is so, and your hire I shall not refuse you, which is all that the labourer is entitled to or ever enjoys. I remember when I was at school to have heard some verses which for the excellence of their doctrine made an impression on me purporting that the birds of the air and the beasts of the field work not for themselves. It is true the farmer allows fodder to his oxen and pasture to his sheep, but it is for his own service, not theirs. In the same manner, the plowman, the shepherd, the weaver, the builder, and the soldier work not for themselves, but others. They are contented with a poor pittance, the laborers hire, and permit us, the great, to enjoy the fruits of their labors. Aristotle, as my master told us, hath plainly proved in the first book of his politics that the low, mean, useful part of mankind are born slaves to the wills of their superiors, and are indeed as much their property as the cattle. It is well said of us, the higher order of mortals, that we are born only to devour the fruits of the earth, and it may be as well said of the lower class, that they are born only to produce them for us. Is not the battle gained by the sweat and danger of the common soldier? Are not the honor and fruits of the victory the generals who laid the scheme? Is not the house built by the labor of the carpenter and the bricklayer? Is it not built for the profit only of the architect and for the use of the inhabitant, who could not easily have placed one brick upon another? Is not the cloth, or the silk, wrought into its form, and variegated with all the beauty of colors, by those who are forced to content themselves with the coarsest and vilest part of their work, while the profit and enjoyment of their labors fall to the share of others? Cast your eye abroad, and see who is it lives in the most magnificent buildings, feasts his palate with the most luxurious dainties, his eyes with the most beautiful sculptures and delicate paintings, and clothes himself in the finest and richest apparel. And tell me if all these do not fall to his lot, who had not any the least share in producing all these conveniences, nor the least ability so to do. Why, then, should the state of a prig, footnote, a thief, differ from all others? Or why should you, who are the laborer only, the executor of my scheme, 
expect a share in the profit. Be advised, therefore, deliver the whole booty to me, and trust to my bounty for your reward. Mr. Bagshot was sometime silent, and looked like a man thunderstruck, but at last, recovering himself from his surprise, he thus began. If you think, Mr. Wilde, by the force of your arguments to get the money out of my pocket, you are greatly mistaken. What is all this stuff to me? D blank blank in me. I am a man of honor, and though I can't talk as well as you, by G blank D, you shall not make a fool of me, and if you take me for one, I must tell you, you are a rascal. At these words, he laid his hand to his pistol. Wilde, perceiving the little success the great strength of his arguments had met with, and the hasty temper of his friend, gave over his design for the present, and told Bagshot he was only in jest. But this coolness with which he treated the other's flame had rather the effect of oil than of water. Bagshot replied in a rage, D blank blank in me. I don't like such jests. I see you are a pitiful rascal and a scoundrel. Wild, with a philosophy worthy of great admiration, returned, As for your abuse, I have no regard to it, but to convince you I am not afraid of you, let us lay the whole booty on the table, and let the conqueror take it all. And having so said, he threw his shining hanger, whose glittering so dazzled the eyes of Bagshot, that in tone entirely altered, he said, No, he was contented with what he had already, that it was mighty ridiculous in them to quarrel among themselves, that they had common enemies enough abroad, against whom they should unite their common force, that if he had mistaken Wilde, he was sorry for it, and as for a jest, he could take a jest as well as another. Wilde, who had a wonderful knack of discovering and applying to the passions of men, beginning now to have a little insight into his friend, and to conceive what arguments would make the quickest impression on him, cried out in a loud voice, that he had bullied him into drawing his hanger, and since it was out, he would not put it up without satisfaction. What satisfaction would you have? answered the other. Your money, or your blood, said Wilde. Why, look ye, Mr. Wilde, if you want to borrow a little of my part, since I know you to be a man of honor, I don't care if I lend you, for though I am not afraid of any man living, yet rather than break with a friend, and as it may be necessary for your occasions, Wilde, who often declared that he looked upon borrowing to be as good a way of taking as any, and, as he called it, the genteelest kind of sneaking budge, putting up his hanger, and shaking his friend by the hand, told him he had hit the nail on the head, it was really his present necessity only that prevailed with him against his will, for that his honor was concerned to pay a considerable sum the next morning. Upon which, contenting himself with one half of Bagshot's share, so that he had three parts in four of the whole, he took leave of his companion, and retired to rest. End of Book 1, Chapter 8 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Book 1, Chapter 9 Of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild, The Great, by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Nine. Wild pays a visit to Miss Leticia Snap. A description of that lovely young creature, and the successless issue of Mr. Wilde's addresses. The next morning, when our hero waked, he began to think of paying a visit to Miss Tishy Snap, a woman of great merit, and of as great generosity. Yet Mr. Wilde found a present was ever most welcome to her, as being a token of respect in her lover. He therefore went directly to a toy shop, and there purchased a genteel snuff-box, with which he waited upon his mistress, whom he found in the most beautiful undress. Her lovely hair hung wantonly over her forehead, being neither white with, nor yet free from, powder. A neat double clout, which seemed to have been worn a few weeks only, was pinned under her chin. Some remains of that art with which ladies improve nature shone on her cheeks. Her body was loosely attired, without stays or jumps, so that her breasts had uncontrolled liberty to display their beauteous orbs, which they did as low as her girdle. A thin covering of a rumpled muslin handkerchief almost hid them from the eyes, save in a few parts, where a good-natured hole gave opportunity to the naked breast to appear. Her gown was a satin of a whitish color, with about a dozen little silver spots upon it, so artificially interwoven at great distance, that they looked as if they had fallen there by chance. This, flying open, discovered a fine yellow petticoat, beautifully edged round the bottom with a narrow piece of half-gold lace, which was now almost become fringe. Beneath this appeared another petticoat stiffened with whalebone, vulgarly called a hoop which hung six inches at least below the other, and under this again appeared an undergarment of that color which Ovid intends when he says, Qui color albus eret nunc es contrarius albo. She likewise displayed two pretty feet covered with silk and adorned with lace and tied the right with a handsome piece of blue ribbon, the left, as more unworthy, with a piece of yellow stuff, which seemed to have been a strip of her upper petticoat. Such was the lovely creature whom Mr. Wilde attended. She received him at first with some of that coldness which women of strict virtue, by a commendable, though sometimes painful, restraint, enjoined themselves to their lovers. The snuff-box, being produced, was at first civilly, indeed, gently refused, but on a second application accepted. The tea-table was soon called for, at which a discourse passed between these young lovers, which, could we set it down with any accuracy, would be very edifying, as well as entertaining to our reader, let it suffice, then, that the wit, together with the beauty of this young creature, so inflamed the passion of Wild, which, though an honourable sort of passion, was at the same time so extremely violent that it transported him to freedoms too offensive to the nice chastity of Leticia, who was, to confess the truth, more indebted to her own strength for the preservation of her virtue than to the awful respect or backwardness of her lover. He was indeed so very urgent in his addresses that had he not with many oaths promised her marriage, 
we could scarcely have been strictly justified in calling his passion honourable. But he was so remarkably attached to decency, that he never offered any violence to a young lady, without the most earnest promises of that kind, these being, he said, a ceremonial due to female modesty, which cost so little, and were so easily pronounced, that the omission could arise from nothing but the mere wantonness of brutality. The lovely Leticia, either out of prudence, or perhaps religion, of which she was a liberal professor, was deaf to all his promises, and luckily invincible by his force, for, though she had not learnt the art of well clenching her fist, nature had not, however, left her defenceless, for, at the ends of her fingers, she wore arms, which she used with such admirable dexterity, that the hot blood of Mr. Wilde soon began to appear in several little spots on his face, and his full-blown cheeks to resemble that part which modesty forbids a boy to turn up anywhere but in a public school, after some pedagogue, strong of arm, hath exercised his talents thereon. Wild now retreated from the conflict, and the victorious Leticia, with becoming triumph and noble spirit, cried out, D blank blank in your eyes, if this be your way of showing your love, I'll warrant I gives you enough unt. She then proceeded to talk of her virtue, which Wild bid her carry to the devil with her, and thus our lovers parted. End of Book 1, Chapter 9, read by Dennis Sayers, in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Book 1, Chapter 10, of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great, by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Ten. A discovery of some matters concerning the chaste Leticia, which must wonderfully surprise, and perhaps affect our reader. Mr. Wilde was no sooner departed than the fair conqueress opening the door of a closet, called forth a young gentleman whom she had there enclosed at the approach of the other. The name of this gallant was Tom Smirk. He was clerk to an attorney, and was indeed the greatest beau and the greatest favourite of the ladies at the end of the town where he lived, as we take dress to be the characteristic or efficient quality of a bow, we shall, instead of giving any character of this young gentleman, content ourselves with describing his dress only to our readers. He wore, then, a pair of white stockings on his legs, and pumps on his feet. His buckles were a large piece of pinchbeck plate, which almost covered his whole foot. His breeches were of red plush which hardly reached his knees. His waistcoat was a white dimity, richly embroidered with yellow silk, over which he wore a blue plush coat with metal buttons, a smart sleeve, and a cape reaching halfway down his back. His wig was of a brown color, covering almost half his pate, on which was hung, on one side, a little laced hat but cocked with great smartness. Such was the accomplished smirk, who, at his issuing forth from the closet, was received with open arms by the amiable Letitia, 
She addressed him by the tender name of Dear Tommy, and told him she had dismissed the odious creature whom her father intended for her husband, and had now nothing to interrupt her happiness with him. Here, reader, thou must pardon us if we stop a while to lament the capriciousness of nature in forming this charming part of the creation designed to complete the happiness of man, with their soft innocence to allay his ferocity, with their sprightliness to soothe his cares, and with their constant friendship to relieve all the troubles and disappointments which can happen to him. Seeing, then, that these are the blessings chiefly sought after, and generally found in every wife, how must we lament that disposition in these lovely creatures, which leads them to prefer in their favour those individuals of the other sex who do not seem intended by nature as so great a masterpiece. For surely, however useful they may be in the creation, as we are taught that nothing, not even a louse, is made in vain, yet these bows, even that most splendid and honoured part which in this our island nature loves to distinguish in red, are not, as some think, the noblest work of the Creator. For my part, let any man choose to himself two bows, let them be captains or colonels, as well-dressed men as ever lived, I would venture to oppose a single Sir Isaac Newton, a Shakespeare, a Milton, or perhaps some few others, to both these bows. Nay, I very much doubt whether it had not been better for the world in general that neither of these bows had ever been born than that it should have wanted the benefit arising to it from the labor of any one of those persons. If this be true, how melancholy must be the consideration that any single bow, especially if he have but half a yard of ribbon in his hat, shall weigh heavier in the scale of female affection than twenty Sir Isaac Newtons. How must our reader, who perhaps had wisely accounted for the resistance which the chaste Leticia had made to the violent addresses of the ravished, or rather ravishing, wild, from that lady's impregnable virtue. How must he blush, I say, to perceive her quit the strictness of her carriage, and abandon herself to those loose freedoms which she indulged to smirk? But, alas, when we discover all, as to preserve the fidelity of our history we must, when we relate that every familiarity had passed between them, and that the fair Leticia, for we must, in this single instance, imitate Virgil, when he drops the pious and the potter, and drop our favorite epithet of chaste, the fair Leticia had, I say, made smirk as happy as wild desired to be what must then be our reader's confusion we will therefore draw a curtain over this scene from that phylogeny which is in us and proceed to matters which instead of dishonouring the human species will greatly raise and ennoble it <laughs> End of Book 1, Chapter 10 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Book 1, Chapter 11 Of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Dennis Sayers The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild, The Great, by Henry Fielding Book One, Chapter Eleven 
containing as notable instances of human greatness as are to be met with in ancient or modern history, concluding with some wholesome hints to the gay part of mankind. Wilde no sooner parted from the chaste Laetitia than, recollecting that his friend, the Count, was returned to his lodgings in the same house, he resolved to visit him, for he was none of those half-bred fellows who are ashamed to see their friends when they have plundered and betrayed them, from which base and pitiful temper many monstrous cruelties have been transacted by men who have sometimes carried their modesty so far as to the murder or utter ruin of those against whom their consciences have suggested to them that they have committed some small trespass, either by the debauching a friend's wife or daughter, belying or betraying the friend himself, or some other such trifling instance. In our hero there was nothing not truly great. He could, without the least abashment, drink a bottle with the man who knew he had the moment before picked his pocket, and when he had stripped him of everything he had, never desired to do him any further mischief. For he carried good nature to that wonderful and uncommon height, that he never did a single injury to man or woman, by which he himself did not expect to reap some advantage. He would often say, that by the contrary party, men often made a bad bargain with the devil, and did his work for nothing. Our hero found the captive count not basely lamenting his fate, nor abandoning himself to despair, but with due resignation employing himself in preparing several packs of cards for future exploits. The count, little suspecting that Wilde had been the sole contriver of the misfortune which had befallen him, rose up and eagerly embraced him, and Wilde returned his embrace with equal warmth. They were no sooner seated than Wilde took an occasion, from seeing the cards lying on the table, to inveigh against gaming, and with an usual and highly commendable freedom after first exaggerating the distressed circumstances in which the Count was then involved, imputed all his misfortunes to that cursed itch of play, which, he said, he concluded had brought his present confinement upon him, and must unavoidably end in his destruction. The other, with great alacrity, defended his favourite amusement, or rather employment, and having told his friend the great success he had after his unluckily quitting the room, acquainted him with the accident which followed, and which the reader, as well as Mr. Wilde, hath had some intimation of before, adding, however, one circumstance not hitherto mentioned, viz., that he had defended his money with the utmost bravery and had dangerously wounded at least two of the three men that had attacked him. This behavior Wilde, who not only knew the extreme readiness with which the booty had been delivered, but also the constant frigidity of the Count's courage, highly applauded, and wished he had been present to assist him. The Count then proceeded to animadvert on the carelessness of the watch, and the scandal it was to the laws that honest people could not walk the streets in safety. And after expatiating some time on that subject, he asked Mr. Wilde if he ever saw so prodigious a run of luck, for so he chose to call his winning, though he knew Wilde was well acquainted with his having loaded dice in his pocket. The other answered it was indeed prodigious, and almost sufficient to justify any person who did not know him better in suspecting his fair play. No man, I believe, dares call that in question.
replied he. No, surely, says Wilde, you are well known to be a man of more honour. But, pray, sir, continued he, did the rascals rob you of all? Every shilling, cries the other, with an oath. They did not leave me a single stake. While they were thus discoursing, Mr. Snap, with a gentleman who followed him, introduced Mr. Bagshot into the company. It seems Mr. Bagshot, immediately after his separation from Mr. Wilde, returned to the gaming table, where, having trusted to fortune that treasure which he had procured by his industry, the faithless goddess committed a breach of trust, and sent Mr. Bagshot away with as empty pockets as are to be found in any laced coat in the kingdom. Now, as that gentleman was walking to a certain reputable house, or shed, in Covent Garden Market, he fortuned to meet with Mr. Snap, who had just returned from conveying the Count to his lodgings, and was then walking to and fro before the gaming-house door. For you are to know, my good reader, if you have never been a man of wit and pleasure about town, that, as the voracious pike lieth snug under some weed before the mouth of any of those little streams which discharge themselves into a large river, waiting for the small fry which issue thereout. So, hourly, before the door or mouth of these gaming-houses, doth Mr. Snap, or some other gentleman of his occupation, attend the issuing forth of the small fry, of young gentlemen, to whom they deliver little slips of parchment, containing invitations of the said gentlemen to their houses, together with one Mr. John Doe. Footnote. This is a fictitious name, which is put into every writ, for what purpose the lawyers best know. Mr. John Doe, a person whose company is in great request. Mr. Snap, among many others of these billets, happened to have one directed to Mr. Bagshot, being at the suit or solicitation of one Mrs. Anne Sample, spinster, at whose house the said Bagshot had lodged several months, and which he had inadvertently departed without taking a formal leave, on which account Mrs. Anne had taken this method of speaking with him. Mr. Snap's house, being now very full of good company, he was obliged to introduce Mr. Bagshot into the Count's apartment, it being, as he said, the only chamber he had to lock up in. Mr. Wilde no sooner saw his friend than he ran eagerly to embrace him, and immediately presented him to the Count received him with great civility. End of Book 1, Chapter 11 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Book One, Chapter Twelve of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Twelve. Other particulars relating to Miss Tishy, which perhaps may not greatly surprise after the former, the description of a very nice gentleman, and a dialogue between Wilde and the Count, in which public virtue is just hinted at, with, etc. Mr. Snap had turned the key a very few minutes, before a servant of the family called Mr. Bagshot out of the room, telling him there was a person below who desired to speak with him. 
and this was no other than Miss Leticia Snap, whose admirer Mr. Bagshot had long been, and in whose tender breast his passion had raised a more ardent flame than that which any of his rivals had been able to raise. Indeed, she was so extremely fond of this youth, that she often confessed to her female confidants, if she could ever have listened to the thought of living with any one man, Mr. Bagshot was he. Nor was she singular in this inclination, many other young ladies being her rivals in this matter, who had all the great and noble qualifications necessary to form a true gallant, and which nature is seldom so extremely bountiful as to indulge to any one person. We will endeavour, however, to describe them all with as much exactness as possible. He was then six feet high, had large calves, broad shoulders, a ruddy complexion, with brown curled hair, a modest assurance, and clean linen. He had indeed, it must be confessed, some small deficiencies to counterbalance these heroic qualities, for he was the silliest fellow in the world, could neither write nor read, nor had he a single grain or spark of honour, honesty, or good nature in his whole composition. As soon as Mr. Bagshot had quitted the room, the Count, taking Wilde by the hand, told him he had something to communicate to him of very great importance. "'I am very well convinced,' said he, "'that Bagshot is the person who robbed me.' Wilde started with great amazement at this discovery, and answered with a most serious countenance, I advise you to take care how you cast any such reflections on a man of Mr. Bagshot's nice honour, for I am certain he will not bear it. D blank blank in his honour, quoth the enraged Count, nor can I bear being robbed. I will apply to a justice of peace. Wilde replied, with great indignation, Since you dare entertain such a suspicion against my friend, I will henceforth disclaim all acquaintance with you. Mr. Bagshot is a man of honour, and my friend, and consequently it is impossible he should be guilty of a bad action. He added much more to the same purpose, which had not the expected weight with the Count, for the latter seemed still certain as to the person, and resolute in applying for justice, which he said he thought he owed to the public, as well as to himself. Wilde then changed his countenance into a kind of derision, and spoke as follows. Suppose it should be possible that Mr. Bagshot had, in a frolic, for I will call it no other, taken this method of borrowing your money. What will you get by prosecuting him? Not your money again, for you hear he was stripped at the gaming table, of which Bagshot had, during their short confabulation, informed them. You will get, then, an opportunity of being still more out of pocket by the prosecution. Another advantage you may promise yourself is the being blown up at every gaming house in town, for that I will assure you of, and then much good may it do you to sit down with the satisfaction of having discharged what it seems you owe the public. I am ashamed of my own discernment when I mistook you for a great man. Would it not be better for you to receive part perhaps all of your money, again, by a wise concealment. For, however seedy, footnote, poor, however seedy Mr. Bagshot may be now, if he hath really played this frolic with you, you may believe he will play it with others, and when he is in cash, you may depend on a restoration. 
the law will be always in your power, and that is the last remedy which a brave or a wise man would resort to. Leave the affair, therefore, to me. I will examine Bagshot, and, if I find he hath played you this trick, I will engage my own honour. You shall in the end be no loser. The Count answered, If I was sure to be no loser, Mr. Wilde, I apprehend you have a better opinion of my understanding than to imagine I would prosecute a gentleman for the sake of the public. These are foolish words, of course, which we learn a ridiculous habit of speaking, and will often break from us without any design or meaning. I assure you, all I desire is a reimbursement, and if I can by your means obtain that, the public may, concluding with the phrase too coarse to be inserted in a history of this kind. They were now informed that dinner was ready, and the company assembled below stairs, whither the reader may, if he please, attend these gentlemen. There sat down at the table Mr. Snap and the two Miss Snaps, his daughters, Mr. Wilde the elder, Mr. Wilde the younger, the Count, Mr. Bagshot, and a grave gentleman who had formerly had the honour of carrying arms in a regiment of foot, and who was now engaged in the office, perhaps a more profitable one, of assisting or following Mr. Snap in the execution of the laws of his country. Nothing very remarkable passed at dinner. The conversation, as is usual in polite company, rolled chiefly on what they were then eating, and what they had lately eaten. In this the military gentleman, who had served in Ireland, gave them a very particular account of a new manner of roasting potatoes, and others gave an account of other dishes. In short, an indifferent bystander would have concluded from their discourse that they had all come into this world for no other purpose than to fill their bellies. And, indeed, if this was not the chief, it is probable it was the most innocent design nature had in their formation. As soon as the dish was removed, and the ladies retired, the Count proposed a game at hazard, which was immediately assented to by the whole company, and, the dice being immediately brought in, the Count took up the box and demanded who would set him, to which no one made any answer, imagining, perhaps, the Count's pockets to be more empty than they were, for, in reality, that gentleman, notwithstanding what he had heartily swore to Mr. Wilde, had, since his arrival at Mr. Snap's, conveyed a piece of plate to pawn, by which means he had furnished himself with ten guineas. The Count, therefore, perceiving this backwardness in his friends, and probably somewhat guessing at the cause of it, took the said guineas out of his pocket, and threw them on the table, when, lo, such is the force of example, all the rest began to produce their funds, and immediately a considerable sum glittering in their eyes, the game began. End of Book 1, Chapter 12 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Book 1, Chapter 13 of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Thirteen. 
a chapter of which we are extremely vain, and which, indeed, we look on as our chef d'oeuvre, containing a wonderful story concerning the devil, and as nice a scene of honour as ever happened. My reader, I believe, even if he be a gamester, would not thank me for an exact relation of every man's success. Let it suffice, then, that they played till the whole money vanished from the table. Whether the devil himself carried it away, as some suspected, I will not determine. But very surprising it was that every person protested he had lost, nor could any one guess who, unless the devil, had won. But, though very probable it is that this arch-fiend had some share in the booty, it is likely he had not all, Mr. Bagshot being imagined to be a considerable winner, notwithstanding his assertions to the contrary, for he was seen by several to convey money often into his pocket, and what is still a little stronger presumption is that the grave gentleman whom we have mentioned to have served his country into honourable capacities not being willing to trust alone to the evidence of his eyes had frequently dived into the said bagshot's pocket whence as he tells us in the apology for his life afterwards published footnote not in a book by itself, in imitation of some other such persons, but in the ordinary's account, etc., where all the apologies for the lives of rogues and whores, which have been published within these twenty years, should have been inserted. Into the said bagshot's pocket, whence, though he might extract a few pieces, he was very sensible he had left many behind. The gentleman had long indulged his curiosity in this way, before Mr. Bagshot, in the heat of gaming, had perceived him. But, as Bagshot was now leaving off play, he discovered this ingenious feat of dexterity, upon which, leaping up from his chair in violent passion, he cried out, I thought I had been among gentlemen and men of honour, but d blank blank in me, I find we have a pickpocket in company. The scandalous sound of this word extremely alarmed the whole board, nor did they all show less surprise than the c o n v blank blank n, who's not sitting of late is much lamented, would express at hearing there was an atheist in the room, but it more particularly affected the gentleman at whom it was leveled, though it was not addressed to him. He likewise started from his chair, and with a fierce countenance and accent said, Do you mean me? D blank blank in your eyes, you are a rascal and a scoundrel. Those words would have been immediately succeeded by blows had not the company interposed, and with strong arm withheld the two antagonists from each other. It was, however, a long time before they could be prevailed on to sit down which being at last happily brought about, Mr. Wilde, the elder, who was a well-disposed old man, advised them to shake hands and be friends. But the gentleman who had received the first affront absolutely refused it, and swore he would have the villain's blood. Mr. Snap highly applauded the resolution, and affirmed that the affront was by no means to be put up by any who bore the name of a gentleman, and that unless his friend resented it properly, he would never execute another warrant in his company, that he had always looked upon him as a man of honour, 
and doubted not but he would prove himself so, and that, if it was his own case, nothing should persuade him to put up such an affront without proper satisfaction. The Count likewise spoke on the same side, and the parties themselves muttered several short sentences purporting their intentions. At last Mr. Wilde, our hero, rising slowly from his seat, and having fixed the attention of all present, began as follows. I have heard with infinite pleasure everything which the two gentlemen who spoke last have said with relation to honour, nor can any man possibly entertain a higher and nobler sense of that word, nor a greater esteem of its inestimable value than myself. If we have no name to express it by in our cant dictionary, it were well to be wished we had. It is, indeed, the essential quality of a gentleman, and which no man who ever was great in the field, or on the road, as others express it, can possibly be without. But, alas, gentlemen, what pity is it that a word of such sovereign use and virtue should have so uncertain and various an application that scarce two people mean the same thing by it. Do not some by honour mean good nature and humanity, which weak minds call virtues? How then must we deny it to the great, the brave, the noble, to the sackers of towns, the plunderers of provinces, and the conquerors of kingdoms, were not these men of honour? And yet they scorn those pitiful qualities I have mentioned. Again, some few, or I am mistaken, include the idea of honesty in their honour. <laughs> and shall we then say, that no man who withholds from another what law, or justice, perhaps, calls his own, or who greatly and boldly deprives him of such property, is a man of honour? Heaven forbid I should say so in this, or indeed in any other good company. Is honour truth? No, it is not in the lies going from us, but in its coming to us, our honour is injured. Doth it then consist in what the vulgar call cardinal virtues? It would be an affront to your understandings to suppose it, since we see every day so many men of honour without any. In what then doth the word honour consist? Why? in itself alone. A man of honour is he that is called a man of honour, and while he is so called, he so remains, and no longer. Think not anything a man commits can forfeit his honour. Look abroad into the world. The prig, while he flourishes, is a man of honour. When in jail, at the bar, or the tree, he is so no longer. And why is this distinction? Not from his actions, for those are often as well known in his flourishing estate as they are afterwards. But because men, I mean those of his own party or gang, call him a man of honour in the former, and cease to call him so in the latter condition. Let us see, then, how hath Mr. Bagshot injured the gentleman's honour? Why, he hath called him a pickpocket, and that, probably, by a severe construction, and a long roundabout way of reasoning, may seem a little to derogate from his honour, if considered in a very nice sense. Admitting it, therefore, for argument's sake, to be some small imputation on his honour, let Mr. Bagshot give him satisfaction. 
let him doubly and triply repair this oblique injury by directly asserting that he believes he is a man of honour. The gentleman answered he was content to refer it to Mr. Wilde, and whatever satisfaction he thought sufficient he would accept. Let him give me my money again first, said Bagshot, and then I will call him a man of honour with all my heart. The gentleman then protested he had not any, which Snap seconded, declaring he had his eyes on him all the while. But Bagshot remained still unsatisfied, till Wild, wrapping out a hearty oath, swore he had not taken a single farthing, adding that whoever asserted the contrary gave him the lie, and he would resent it. And now such was the ascendancy of this great man that Bagshot immediately acquiesced, and performed the ceremonies required, and thus by the exquisite address of our hero this quarrel, which had so fatal an aspect, and which between two persons so extremely jealous of their honour, would most certainly have produced very dreadful consequences, was happily concluded. Mr. Wilde was indeed a little interested in this affair, as he himself had set the gentleman to work, and had received the greatest part of the booty and as to Mr. Snap's disposition in his favour, it was the usual height to which the ardour of that worthy person's friendship too frequently hurried him. It was his constant maxim that he was a pitiful fellow who would stick at a little rapping. Footnote. Rapping is a cant word for perjury. A little rapping for his friend. End of Book One, Chapter Thirteen. Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Book One, Chapter Fourteen of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great by Henry Fielding. Book One, Chapter Eleven, in which the history of greatness is continued. Matters being thus reconciled, and the gaming over, for reasons before hinted, the company proceeded to drink about, with the utmost cheerfulness and friendship, drinking healths, shaking hands, and professing the most perfect affection for each other, all which were not in the least interrupted by some designs which they then agitated in their minds and which they intended to execute as soon as the liquor had prevailed over some of their understandings. Bagshot and the gentleman, intending to rob each other, Mr. Snap and Mr. Wilde, the elder, meditating what other creditors they could find out to charge the gentleman then in custody with, the Count hoping to renew the play, and Wilde, our hero, laying a design to put Bagshot out of the way, or, as the vulgar express it, to hang him with the first opportunity. But none of these great designs could at present be put in execution, for Mr. Snap being soon after summoned abroad on business of great moment, which required, likewise, the assistance of Mr. Wilde the Elder and his other friend, and as he did not care to trust to the nimbleness of the Count's heels, of which he had already had some experience, he declared he must lock up for that evening. 
here, reader, if them pleasest, as we are in no great haste, we will stop and make a simile. As when their lap is finished, the cautious huntsman to their kennel gathers the nimble-footed hounds. They with lank ears and tails slouch sullenly on, whilst he, with his whippers in, follows close at their heels, regardless of their dogged humour, till, having seen them safe within the door, he turns the key, and then retires to whatever business or pleasure calls him thence. So, with lowering countenance and reluctant steps, mounted the count and bagshot to their chamber, or rather kennel, whither they were attended by Snap and those who followed him, and where Snap, having seen them deposited, very contentedly locked the door and departed. And now, reader, we will, in imitation of the truly laudable custom of the world, leave these our good friends to deliver themselves as they can, and pursue the thriving fortunes of Wild, our hero, who, with that great aversion to satisfaction and content, which is inseparably incident to great minds, began to enlarge his views with his prosperity. For this restless, amiable disposition, this noble avidity, which increases with feeding, is the first principle, or constituent quality, of these our great men, to whom, in their passage on to greatness, it happens as to a traveller over the Alps, or, if this be a too far-fetched simile, to one who travels westward over the hills near Bath, where the simile was indeed made. He sees not the end of his journey at once, but passing on from scheme to scheme, and from hill to hill, with noble constancy, resolving still to attain the summit on which he hath fixed his eye, however dirty the roads may be through which he struggles, he at length arrives, at some vile inn, where he finds no kind of entertainment nor conveniency for repose. I fancy, reader, if thou hast ever travelled in these roads, one part of my simile is sufficiently apparent. And, indeed, in all these illustrations, one side is generally much more apparent than the other. But, believe me, if the other doth not so evidently appear to thy satisfaction, it is from no other reason than because thou art unacquainted with these great men, and hast not had sufficient instruction, leisure, or opportunity, to consider what happens to those who pursue what is generally understood by greatness. For surely if thou hadst any adverted not only on the many perils to which great men are daily liable while they are in their progress, but hadst discerned, as it were, through a microscope, for it is invisible to the naked eye, that diminutive speck of happiness which they attain even in the consumption of their wishes, thou wouldst lament with me the unhappy fate of these great men, on whom nature hath set so superior a mark that the rest of mankind are born for their use and emolument only, and be apt to cry out, It is pity that those for whose pleasure and profit mankind are to labor and sweat, to be hacked and hewed, to be pillaged, plundered, and every war destroyed, should reap so little advantage from all the miseries they occasion to others. For my part, I own myself of that humble kind of mortals who consider themselves born for the behoof of some great man or other, and could I behold his happiness carved out of the labor and ruin of a thousand such reptiles as myself, I might with satisfaction exclaim, Sic, sic, juvat! 
but when I behold one great man, starving with hunger and freezing with cold, in the midst of fifty thousand who are suffering the same evils for his diversion, when I see another whose own mind is a more abject slave to his own greatness, and is more tortured and racked by it, than those of all his vassals. Lastly, when I consider whole nations rooted out only to bring tears into the eyes of a great man, not indeed because he hath extirpated so many, but because he had no more nations to extirpate, then, truly, I am almost inclined to wish that nature had spared us this her masterpiece, and that no great man had ever been born into the world. But to proceed with our history, which will, we hope, produce much better lessons and more instructive than any we can preach. Wild was no sooner retired to a night cellar than he began to reflect on the sweets he had that day enjoyed from the labors of others, viz. first from Mr. Bagshot, who had for his use robbed the good count, and secondly from the gentleman who for the same good purpose had picked the pocket of Bagshot. He then proceeded to reason thus with himself. The art of policy is the art of multiplication, the degrees of greatness being constituted by those two little words more or less. Mankind are first properly to be considered under two grand divisions, those that use their own hands and those who employ the hands of others. The former are the base and rabble, the latter the genteel part of the creation. The mercantile part of the world, therefore, wisely use of the term employing hands, and justly prefer each other as they employ more or fewer. For thus one merchant says he is greater than another, because he employs more hands. And now indeed the merchant should seem to challenge some character of greatness. Did we not necessarily come to a second division, viz. of those who employ hands for the use of the community in which they live? And of those who employ hands merely for their own use, without any regard to the benefit of society. Of the former sort are the yeoman, the manufacturer, the merchant, and perhaps the gentleman. The first of these being to manure and cultivate his native soil, and to employ hands to produce the fruits of the earth the second being to improve them by employing hands likewise, and to produce from them those useful commodities which serve as well for the conveniences as necessaries of life. The third is to employ hands for the exportation of the redundance of our own commodities, and to exchange them with the redundances of foreign nations, that thus every soil and every climate may enjoy the fruits of the whole earth. The gentleman is, by employing hands, likewise to embellish his country with the improvement of art and sciences, with the making and executing good and wholesome laws for the preservation of property and the distribution of justice, and in several other manners to be useful to society. Now we come to the second part of this division, viz. of those who employ hands for their own use only, and this is that noble and great part who are generally distinguished into conquerors, absolute princes, statesmen, and prigs. Footnote. Thieves. Now, all these differ from each other in greatness only, they employ more or fewer hands, 
and Alexander the Great was only greater than a captain of one of the Tartarian or Arabian hordes, as he was at the head of a larger number. In what, then, is a single prig inferior to any other great man, but because he employs his own hands only, for he is not on that account to be leveled with the base and vulgar, because he employs his hands for his own use only. Now, suppose a prig had as many tools as any prime minister ever had, would he not be as great as any prime minister whatsoever? Undoubtedly he would. What then have I to do in the pursuit of greatness, but to procure a gang, and to make the use of this gang center in myself? This gang shall rob for me only, receiving very moderate rewards for their action. Out of this gang I will prefer to my favor the boldest and most iniquitous, as the vulgar express it. The rest I will, from time to time, as I see occasion, transport and hang at my pleasure. And thus, which I take to be the highest excellence of a prig, convert those laws which are made for the benefit and protection of society to my single use. Having thus preconceived his scheme, he saw nothing wanting to put it in immediate execution, but that which is indeed the beginning as well as the end of all human devices, I mean money, of which commodity he was possessed of no more than sixty-five guineas, being all that remained from the double benefits he had made of bagshot, and which did not seem sufficient to furnish his house, and every other convenience necessary for so grand an undertaking. He resolved, therefore, to go immediately to the gaming-house, which was then sitting, not so much with an intention of trusting to fortune, as to play the surer card of attacking the winner in his way home. On his arrival, however, he thought he might as well try his success at the dice, and reserve the other resource as his last expedient. He accordingly sat down to play, and as fortune, no more than others of her sex, is observed to distribute her favors, with strict regard to great mental endowments, so our hero lost every farthing in his pocket. This loss, however, he bore with great constancy of mind, and with as great composure of aspect. To say truth, he considered the money as only lent for a short time, or rather indeed as deposited with the banker, he then resolved to have immediate recourse to his surer stratagem, and casting his eyes round the room, he soon perceived a gentleman sitting in a disconsolate posture, who seemed a proper instrument or tool for his purpose. In short, to be as concise as possible in these least shining parts of our history, Wilde accosted this man, sounded him, found him fit to execute, proposed the matter, received a ready assent, and having fixed on the person who seemed that evening the greatest favorite of fortune, they posted themselves in the most proper place to surprise the enemy as he was retiring to his quarters, where he was soon attacked, subdued, and plundered, but indeed of no considerable booty, for it seems this gentleman played on a common stock, and had deposited his winnings at the scene of action, nor had he any more than two shillings in his pocket when he was attacked. This was so cruel a disappointment to Wild, and so sensibly affects us, as no doubt it will the reader, that, as it must disqualify us both, from proceeding any farther at present, we will take a little breath, and therefore we shall here close this book.
End of Book 1, Chapter 14. End of Book 1. Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California. For LibriVox. Book 2, Chapter 1 of the late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great by Henry Fielding. Book 2, Chapter 1 Characters of Silly People with the proper uses for which such are designed. One reason why we chose to end our first book, as we did, with the last chapter, was that we are now obliged to produce two characters of a stamp entirely different from what we have hitherto dealt with. These persons are of that pitiful order of mortals who are in contempt called good-natured, being indeed sent into the world by nature with the same design with which men put little fish into a pike-pond, in order to be devoured by that voracious water-hero. But to proceed with our history, Wild, having shared the booty in much the same manner as before, that is, taken three-fourths of it, amounting to eighteen pence, was now retiring to rest, in no very happy mood, when, by accident, he met with a young fellow who had formerly been his companion, and, indeed, intimate friend at school. It hath been thought that friendship is usually nursed by similitude of manners, but the contrary has been the case between these lads, for, whereas Wilde was rapacious and intrepid, the other had always more regard for his skin than his money. Wilde, therefore, had very generously compassionated this defect in his schoolfellow, and had brought him off from many scrapes, into most of which he had first drawn him, by taking the fault and whipping to himself. He had always, indeed, been well paid on such occasions. There are a sort of people who, together with the best of the bargain, will be sure to have the obligation, too, on their side. So it happened here. For this poor lad had considered himself in the highest degree obliged to Mr. Wild, and had contracted a very great esteem and friendship for him, the traces of which an absence of many years had not in the least effaced in his mind. He no sooner knew Wild, therefore, then he accosted him in the most friendly manner, and invited him home with him to breakfast, it being near nine in the morning, which invitation our hero, with no great difficulty, consented to. This young man, who was about Wilde's age, had some time before set up in the trade of a jeweller, in the materials or stock for which he had laid out the greatest part of a little fortune, and had married a very agreeable woman for love, by whom he then had two children. As our reader is to be more acquainted with this person, it may not be improper to open somewhat of his character, especially as it will serve as a kind of foil to the noble and great disposition of our hero, and as the one seems sent into this world as a proper object on which the talents of the other were to be displayed with a proper and just success. Mr. Thomas Hartfree, then, for that was his name, was of an honest and open disposition. He was of that sort of men whom experience only, and not their own natures, must inform that there are such things as deceit and hypocrisy in the world, and who, consequently, are not, at five-and-twenty, so difficult to be imposed upon 
as the oldest and most subtle. He was possessed of several great weaknesses of mind, being good-natured, friendly, and generous to a great excess. He had, indeed, too little regard to common justice, for he had forgiven some debts to his acquaintance only because they could not pay him, and had entrusted a bankrupt, on his setting up a second time, from having been convinced that he had dealt in his bankruptcy with a fair and honest heart, and that he had broke through misfortune only, and not from neglect or imposture. He was, withal, so silly a fellow that he never took the least advantage of the ignorance of his customers, and contented himself with very moderate gains on his goods, which he was the better enabled to do, notwithstanding his generosity, because his life was extremely temperate, his expenses being solely confined to the cheerful entertainment of his friends at home, and now and then a moderate glass of wine, in which he indulged himself in the company of his wife, who, with an agreeable person, was a mean-spirited, poor, domestic, low-bred animal, who confined herself mostly to the care of her family, placed her happiness in her husband and her children, followed no expensive fashions or diversions, and indeed rarely went abroad, unless to return the visits of a few plain neighbors, and twice a year afforded herself, in company with her husband, the diversion of a play, where she never sat in a higher place than the pit. To this silly woman did this silly fellow introduce the great wild, informing her, at the same time, of their school acquaintance, and the many obligations he had received from him. This simple woman no sooner heard her husband had been obliged to her guest than her eyes sparkled on him with a benevolence which is an emanation from the heart, and of which great and noble minds, whose hearts never dwell but with an injury, can have no very adequate idea. It is therefore no wonder that our hero should misconstrue, as he did, the poor, innocent, and ample affection of Mrs. Hartfree towards her husband's friend, for that great and generous passion which fires the eyes of a modern heroine, when the colonel is so kind as to indulge his city creditor with partaking of his table to-day, and of his bed to-morrow. Wilde, therefore, instantly returned the compliment, as he understood it, with his eyes, and pleasantly after bestowed many encomiums on her beauty, with which, perhaps, she, who was a woman, though a good one, and misapprehended the design, was not displeased any more than the husband. When breakfast was ended, and the wife retired to her household affairs, Wilde, who had a quick discernment into the weaknesses of men, and who, besides the knowledge of his good or foolish disposition when a boy, had now discovered several sparks of goodness, friendship, and generosity in his friend, began to discourse over the accidents which had happened in their childhood, and took frequent occasions of reminding him of those favours which we have before mentioned his having conferred on him. He then proceeded to the most vehement professions of friendship, and to the most ardent expressions of joy in this renewal of their acquaintance. He at last told him, with great seeming pleasure, that he believed he had an opportunity of serving him by the recommendation of a gentleman to his custom, who was then on the brink of marriage, and, 
if he be not already engaged, I will, says he, endeavour to prevail on him to furnish his lady with jewels at your shop. Hartfree was not backward in thanks to our hero, and after many earnest solicitations to dinner, which were refused, they parted for the first time. But here, as it occurs to our memory, that our readers may be surprised, an accident which sometimes happens in histories of this kind, how Mr. Wild, the elder, in his present capacity, should have been able to maintain his son at a reputable school, as this appears to have been, it may be necessary to inform him that Mr. Wilde himself was then a tradesman in good business, but by misfortunes in the world, to wit, extravagance and gaming, he had reduced himself to that honourable occupation which we have formerly mentioned. Having cleared up this doubt, we will now pursue our hero, who forthwith repaired to the Count, and having first settled preliminary articles concerning distributions, he acquainted him with the scheme which he had formed against Hartfree, and, after consulting proper methods to put it in execution, they began to concert measures for the enlargement of the Count, on which the first, and indeed only point to be considered, was to raise money, not to pay his debts, for that would have required an immense sum, and was contrary to his inclination or intention, but to procure him bail, for as to his escape, Mr. Snap had taken such precautions that it appeared absolutely impossible. End of Book 2, Chapter 1 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Book 2, Chapter 2 Of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great by Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Two. Great Examples of Greatness in Wild, shown as well by his behavior to Bagshot as in a scheme laid, first to impose on Hartfree by means of the Count and then to cheat the count of the booty. Wilde undertook, therefore, to extract some money from Bagshot, who, notwithstanding the depredations made on him, had carried off a pretty considerable booty from their engagement at Dice the preceding day. He found Mr. Bagshot in expectation of his bail, and, with a countenance full of concern, which he could at any time with wonderful art put on told him that all was discovered that the count knew him and intended to prosecute him for the robbery had not i exerted said he my utmost interest and with great difficulty prevailed on him in case you refund the money refund the money cried bagshot that is in your power, for you know what an inconsiderable part of it fell to my share. How, replied Wild, is this your gratitude to me for saving your life? For your own conscience must convince you of your guilt, and with how much certainty the gentleman can give evidence against you. Marry, come up, quoth Bagshot. I believe my life alone will not be in danger. I know those who are as guilty as myself. Do you tell me of conscience? Yes, sirrah, answered our hero, taking him by the collar. And since you dare threaten me, I will show you the difference between committing a robbery and conniving at it, 
which is all I can charge myself with. I own, indeed, I suspected, when you showed me a sum of money, that you had not come honestly by it. How? says Bagshot, frightened out of one half of his wits, and amazed out of the other. Can you deny? Yes, you rascal, answered Wild. I do deny everything, and do you find a witness to prove it? And to show you how little apprehension I have of your power to hurt me, I will have you apprehended this moment, at which words he offered to break from him. But Bagshot laid hold of his skirts, and, with an altered tone and manner, begged him not to be so impatient. Refund, then, sirrah, cries Wild, and perhaps I may take pity on you. What must I refund? answered Bagshot. Every farthing in your pocket, replied Wild. Then I may have some compassion on you, and not only save your life, but, out of an excess of generosity, may return you something. At which words, Bagshot seeming to hesitate, Wild pretended to make to the door, and rapped out an oath of vengeance with so violent an emphasis that his friend no longer presumed to balance, but suffered Wild to search his pockets and draw forth all he found to the amount of twenty-one guineas and a half, which last piece our generous hero returned him again, telling him he might now sleep secure, but advised him for the future never to threaten his friends. Thus did our hero execute the greatest exploits with the utmost ease imaginable, by means of those transcendent qualities which nature had indulged him with, viz. a bold heart, a thundering voice, and a steady countenance. Wild now returned to the Count, and informed him that he had got ten guineas of bagshot, for, with great and commendable prudence, he sunk the other eleven into his own pocket, and told him, with that money, he would procure him bail, which he after prevailed on his father, and another gentleman of the same occupation, to become, for two guineas each, so that he made lawful prize of six more, making Bagshot debtor for the whole ten, for such were his great abilities, and so vast the compass of his understanding, that he never made any bargain without overreaching, or, in the vulgar phrase, cheating the person with whom he dealt. The account being by these means enlarged, the first thing they did, in order to procure credit from tradesmen, was the taking a handsome house, ready furnished, in one of the new streets, in which, as soon as the Count was settled, they proceeded to furnish him with servants and equipage, and all the insignia of a large estate, proper to impose on poor Hartfree. These being all obtained, Wilde made a second visit to his friend, and with much joy in his countenance, acquainted him that he had succeeded in his endeavours, and that the gentleman had promised to deal with him for the jewels which he intended to present his bride, and which were designed to be very splendid and costly. He therefore appointed him to go to the Count the next morning, and carry with him a set of the richest and most beautiful jewels he had, giving him at the same time some hints of the Count's ignorance of that commodity, and that he might extort what price of him he pleased. But Hartfree told him, not without some disdain, that he scorned to take any such advantage, and after expressing much gratitude to his friend for his recommendation, he promised to carry the jewels at the hour and to the place appointed. I am sensible that the reader, if he hath but the least notion of greatness, must have such a contempt for the extreme 
folly of this fellow, that he will be very little concerned at any misfortunes which may befall him in the sequel, for to have no suspicion that an old schoolfellow, with whom he had, in his tenderest years, contracted a friendship, and who, on the accidental renewing of their acquaintance, had professed the most passionate regard for him, should be very ready to impose on him. In short, to conceive that a friend should, of his own accord, without any view to his own interest, endeavour to do him a service, must argue such weakness of mind, such ignorance of the world, and such an artless, simple, undesigning heart, as must render the person possessed of it the lowest creature and the properest object of contempt imaginable in the eyes of every man of understanding and discernment. Wilde remembered that his friend Hartfree's faults were rather in his heart than in his head, that though he was so mean a fellow that he was never capable of laying a design to injure any human creature, yet was he by no means a fool, nor liable to any gross imposition, unless where his heart betrayed him. He therefore instructed the Count to take only one of his jewels at the first interview, and reject the rest as not fine enough, and order him to provide some richer. He said this management would prevent Hartfree from expecting ready money for the jewel he brought with him, which the Count was presently to dispose of, and by means of that money, and his great abilities at cards and dice, to get together as large a sum as possible, which he was to pay down to Hartfree at the delivery of the set of jewels, who would be thus void of all manner of suspicion, and would not fail to give him credit for the residue. By this contrivance, it will appear in the sequel, that Wilde did not only propose to make the imposition on Hartfree, who was, hitherto, void of all suspicion, more certain, but to rob the Count himself of this sum. This double method of cheating, the very tools who are our instruments to cheat others, is the superlative degree of greatness, and is probably, as far as any spirit crusted over with clay can carry it, falling very little short of diabolism itself. This method was immediately put in execution, and the Count, the first day, took only a single brilliant, worth about three hundred pounds, and ordered a necklace, earrings, and solitaire, of three thousand more, to be prepared by that day seven night. The interval was employed by Wilde in prosecuting his scheme of raising a gang, in which he met with such success that within a few days he had levied several bold and resolute fellows, fit for any enterprise, how dangerous or great soever. We have before remarked that the truest mark of greatness is insatiability. Wilde had covenanted with the Count to receive three-fourths of the booty, and had at the same time covenanted with himself to secure the other fourth part likewise, for which he had formed a very great and noble design. But he now saw with concern that sum which was to be received in hand by Hartfree, in danger of being absolutely lost. In order, therefore, to possess himself of that likewise, he contrived that the jewels should be brought in the afternoon, and that Hartfree should be detained before the Count could see him, so that the knight should overtake him in his return, when two of his gang were ordered to attack and plunder him. End of Book Two, Chapter Two 
Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Book Two, Chapter Three of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great by Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Three, containing scenes of softness, love, and honor all in the great style. The Count had disposed of his jewel for its full value, and this he had by dexterity raised to a thousand pounds. This sum, therefore, he paid down to Hartfree, promising him the rest within a month. His house, his equipage, his appearance, but above all a certain plausibility in his voice and behavior would have deceived any, but one whose great and wise heart had dictated to him something within, which would have secured him from any danger of imposition from without. Hartfree, therefore, did not in the least scruple giving him credit, but as he had in reality procured those jewels of another, his own little stock not being able to furnish anything so valuable, he begged the Count would be so kind to give his note for the money, payable at the time he mentioned, which that gentleman did not in the least scruple. So he paid him the thousand pounds in specie, and gave his note for two thousand eight hundred pounds more to Hartfree, who burnt with gratitude to Wilde for the noble customer he had recommended to him. As soon as Hartfree was departed, Wilde, who waited in another room, came in and received the casket from the Count, it having been agreed between them that this should be deposited in his hands, as he was the original contriver of the scheme, and was to have the largest share. Wilde, having received the casket, offered to meet the Count late that evening to come to a division. But such was the latter's confidence in the honor of our hero, that he said, if it was any inconvenience to him, the next morning would do altogether as well. This was more agreeable to Wilde, and, accordingly, an appointment being made for that purpose, he set out in haste to pursue Hartfree to the place where the two gentlemen were ordered to meet and attack him. Those gentlemen, with noble resolution, executed their purpose. They attacked and spoiled the enemy of the whole sum he had received from the Count. As soon as the engagement was over, and Hartfree left sprawling on the ground, our hero, who wisely declined trusting the booty in his friend's hands, though he had good experience of their honor, made off after the conquerors. At length, they being all at a place of safety, Wild, according to a previous agreement, received nine-tenths of the booty. The subordinate heroes did indeed profess some little unwillingness, perhaps more than was strictly consistent with honor, to perform their contract, but Wild, partly by argument, but more by oaths and threatenings, prevailed with them to fulfill their promise. Our hero, having thus with wonderful address, brought this great and glorious action to a happy conclusion, resolved to relax his mind after his fatigue in the conversation of the fair. He therefore set forwards to his lovely Leticia, but in his way accidentally met with a young lady of his acquaintance, Miss Molly Straddle who was taking the air in Bridges Street. Miss Molly, seeing Mr. Wilde, stopped him, and, 
with a familiarity peculiar to a genteel town education, tapped, or rather slapped him on the back, and asked him to treat her with a pint of wine at a neighboring tavern. The hero, though he loved the chaste Leticia with excessive tenderness, was not of that low, sniveling breed of mortals who, as it is generally expressed, tie themselves to a woman's apron strings, in a word, who are tainted with that mean, base, low vice, or virtue, as it is called, of constancy. Therefore he immediately consented, and attended her to a tavern famous for excellent wine, known by the name of the Rummer and Horseshoe, where they retired to a room by themselves. Wilde was very vehement in his addresses, but to no purpose. The young lady declared she would grant no favor till he had made her a present. This was immediately complied with, and the lover made as happy as he could desire. The immoderate fondness which Wilde entertained for his dear Leticia would not suffer him to waste any considerable time with Miss Straddle. Notwithstanding, therefore, all the endearments and caresses of that young lady, he soon made an excuse to go downstairs, and thence immediately set forward to Leticia, without taking any formal leave of Miss Straddle, or indeed of the drawer, with whom the lady was afterwards obliged to come to an account for the reckoning. Mr. Wilde, on his arrival at Mr. Snap's, found only Miss Dashi at home, that young lady being employed, alone, in imitation of Penelope, with her thread or worsted, only with this difference, that whereas Penelope unraveled by night what she had knit or wove or spun by day, so what our young heroine unraveled by day, she knit again by night. In short, she was mending a pair of blue stockings with red clocks, a circumstance which perhaps we might have omitted, had it not served to show that there are still some ladies of this age who imitate the simplicity of the ancients. Wilde immediately asked for his beloved, and was informed that she was not at home. He then inquired where she was to be found, and declared he would not depart till he had seen her, nay, not till he had married her, for indeed his passion for her was truly honorable. In other words, he had so ungovernable a desire for her person that he would go any length to satisfy it. He then pulled out the casket, which he swore was full of the finest jewels, and that he would give them all to her with other promises which so prevailed on Miss Doshi, who had not the common failure of sisters in envying, and often endeavoring to disappoint each other's happiness, that she desired Mr. Wilde to sit down a few minutes, whilst she endeavored to find her sister, and to bring her to him. The lover thanked her, and promised to stay till her return, and Miss Doshi, leaving Mr. Wilde to his meditations, fastened him in the kitchen by barring the door, for most of the doors in this mansion were made to be bolted on the outside, and then, slapping to the door of the house with great violence, without going out at it, she stole softly upstairs, where Miss Leticia was engaged in close conference with Mr. Bagshot. Miss Letty, being informed by her sister, in a whisper, of what Mr. Wilde had said, and what he had produced, told Mr. Bagshot that a young lady was below to visit her, whom she would dispatch with all imaginable haste, and return to him. She desired him, therefore, to stay with patience for her in the meantime, and that she would leave the door unlocked, though her papa would never forgive her, if he should discover it. Bagshot promised on his honor not to step without his chamber, and 
the two young ladies went softly downstairs, when, pretending first to make their entry into the house, they repaired to the kitchen, where not even the presence of the chaste Leticia could restore that harmony to the countenance of her lover, which Miss Theodosia had left him possessed of, for, during her absence, he had discovered the absence of a purse containing banknotes of nine hundred pounds, which had been taken from Mr. Hartfree, and which, indeed, Miss Straddle had, in the warmth of his amorous caresses, unperceived, drawn from him. However, as he had that perfect mastery of his temper, or rather of his muscles, which is as necessary to the forming a great character as to the personating it on the stage, he soon conveyed a smile into his countenance, and, sealing as well his misfortune as his chagrin at it, began to pay honourable addresses to Miss Letty. This young lady, among many other good ingredients, had three very predominant passions, to wit vanity, wantonness, and avarice. To satisfy the first of these, she employed Mr. Smirk and company. To the second, Mr. Bagshot and company. And our hero had the honor and happiness of solely engrossing the third. Now, these three sorts of lovers she had very different ways of entertaining. With the first, she was all gay and coquette. With the second, all fond and rampant. And with the last, all cold and reserved. She therefore told Mr. Wilde, with a most composed aspect, that she was glad he had repented of his manner of treating her at their last interview, where his behavior was so monstrous that she had resolved never to see him any more, that she was afraid her own sex would hardly pardon her the weakness she was guilty of in receding from that resolution, which she was persuaded she never should have brought herself to, had not her sister, who was there to confirm what she said, as she did with many oaths, betrayed her into his company, by pretending it was another person to visit her. But, however, as he now thought proper to give her more convincing proofs of his affections, for he had now the casket in his hand, and since she perceived his designs were no longer against her virtue, but were such as a woman of honor might listen to, she must own, and then she feigned an hesitation, when Theodosia began, Nay, sister, I am resolved you shall counterfeit no longer. I assure you, Mr. Wilde, she hath the most violent passion for you in the world, and indeed, dear Tishy, if you offer to go back, since I plainly see Mr. Wilde's designs are honorable, I will betray all you have ever said. How, sister, answered Leticia, I protest you will drive me out of the room. I did not expect this usage from you. Wilde then fell on his knees, and taking hold of her hand, repeated a speech, which, as the reader may easily suggest it to himself, I shall not here set down. He then offered her the casket, but she gently rejected it, and, on a second offer, with a modest countenance and voice, desired to know what it contained. Wilde then opened it, and took forth, with sorrow I write it, and with sorrow will it be read, one of those beautiful necklaces with which at the fair of Bartholomew, they deck the well-whitened neck of Thalestris, Queen of Amazons, Anna Bullen, Queen Elizabeth, or some other high princess in drollic story. It was, indeed, 
composed of that paste which Derdeus Magnus, an ingenious toyman, doth at a very moderate price dispense of to the second-rate bows of the metropolis. For, to open a truth, which we ask our reader's pardon for having concealed from him so long, the sagacious Count, wisely fearing lest some accident might prevent Mr. Wilde's return at the appointed time, had carefully conveyed the jewels which Mr. Hartfree had brought with him into his own pocket, and in their stead had placed in the casket these artificial stones, which, though of equal value to a philosopher, and, perhaps, of a much greater to a true admirer of the compositions of art, had not, however, the same charms in the eyes of Miss Letty, who had indeed some knowledge of jewels. For Mr. Snap, with great reason, considering how valuable a part of a lady's education it would be to be well instructed in these things, in an age when young ladies learn little more than how to dress themselves, had, in her youth, placed Miss Letty as the handmaid, or housemaid as the vulgar call it, of an eminent pawnbroker. The lightning, therefore, which should have flashed from the jewels, flashed from her eyes, and thunder immediately followed from her voice. She be knaved, be rascaled, be rogued the unhappy hero, who stood silent, confounded with astonishment, but more with shame and indignation at being thus outwitted and overreached. At length he recovered his spirits, and throwing down the casket in a rage, he snatched the key from the table, and without making any answer to the ladies, who both very plentifully opened upon him, and without taking any leave of them, he flew out at the door, and repaired with the utmost expedition to the Count's habitation. End of Book 2, Chapter 3 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Book 2, Chapter 4 Of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great, by Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Four, in which Wilde, after many fruitless endeavors to discover his friend, moralizes on his misfortune in a speech, which may be of use, if rightly understood, to some other considerable speech-makers, not the highest fed footman of the highest bred woman of quality, knocks with more impetuosity than Wilde did at the Count's door, which was immediately opened by a well-dressed liveryman, who answered that his master was not at home. Wilde, not satisfied with this, searched the house, but to no purpose. He then ransacked all the gaming-houses in town, but found no count. Indeed, that gentleman had taken leave of his house the same instant Mr. Wilde had turned his back, and, equipping himself with boots and a post-horse, without taking with him either servant, clothes, or any necessaries for the journey of a great man, made such mighty expedition that he was now upwards of twenty miles on his way to Dover. Wilde, finding his search ineffectual, resolved to give it over for that night. He then retired to his seat of contemplation, a night-seller, where, without a single farthing in his pocket, he called for a sneaker of punch, and, placing himself on a bench by himself, 
he softly vented with the following soliloquy. How vain is human greatness! What avail superior abilities, and a noble defiance of those narrow rules and bounds, which confine the vulgar, when his best concerted schemes are liable to be defeated? How unhappy is the state of priggism! How impossible for human prudence to foresee and guard against every circumvention! It is even as a game of chess, where, while the rook or knight or bishop is busied forecasting some great enterprise, a worthless pawn exposes and disconcerts his scheme. Better had it been for me to have observed the simple laws of friendship and morality than thus to ruin my friend for the benefit of others. I might have commanded his purse to any degree of moderation. I have now disabled him from the power of serving me. Well, but that was not my design. If I cannot arraign my own conduct, why should I, like a woman or a child, sit down and lament the disappointment of chance? But can I acquit myself of all neglect? Did I not misbehave in putting it into the power of others to outwit me? But that is impossible to be avoided. In this a prig is more unhappy than any other. A cautious man may, in a crowd, preserve his own pockets by keeping his hands in them. But while the prig employs his hands in another's pocket, how shall he be able to defend his own? Indeed, in this light, what can be imagined more miserable than a prig? How dangerous are his acquisitions! How unsafe! How unquiet his possessions! Why, then, should any man wish to be a prig? Or where is his greatness? I answer, in his mind, "'Tis the inward glory, the secret consciousness of doing great and wonderful actions, which can alone support the truly great man, whether he is a conqueror, a tyrant, a statesman, or a prig. These must bear him up against the private curse and public imprecation, and while he is hated and detested by all mankind, must make him inwardly satisfied with himself. For what but some such inward satisfaction as this could inspire men possessed of power, wealth, of every human blessing which pride, avarice, or luxury could desire, to forsake their homes, abandon ease and repose, and at the expense of riches and pleasures, at the price of labor and hardship, and at the hazard of all that fortune hath liberally given them, could send them at the head of a multitude of prigs, called an army to molest their neighbors, to introduce rape, rapine, bloodshed, and every kind of misery among their own species. What but some glorious appetite of mind could inflame princes endowed with the greatest honors and enriched with the most plentiful revenues to desire maliciously to rob those subjects of their liberties who are content to sweat for the luxury and to bow down their knees to the pride of those very princes what but this can inspire them to destroy one half of their subjects in order to reduce the rest to an absolute dependence on their own wills and on those of their brutal successors what other motive could seduce a subject possessed of great property in his community to betray the interest of his fellow subjects of his brethren and his posterity to the wanton disposition of such princes. Lastly, what less inducement 
could persuade the prig to forsake the methods of acquiring a safe, an honest, and a plentiful livelihood, and at the hazard of even life itself, and what is mistaken called dishonor, to break openly and bravely through the laws of his country, for uncertain, unsteady, and unsafe gain. Let me then hold myself contented with this reflection, that I have been wise, though unsuccessful, and am a cheat, though an unhappy man. His soliloquy and his punch concluded together, for he had, at every pause, comforted himself with a sip, and now it came first into his head that it would be more difficult to pay for it than it was to swallow it, when, to his great pleasure, he beheld at another corner of the room one of the gentlemen whom he had employed in the attack of Hartfree, and who, he doubted not, would readily lend him a guinea or two, but he had the mortification on applying to him to hear that the gaming-table had stripped him of all the booty which his own generosity had left in his possession. He was, therefore, obliged to pursue his usual method on such occasions, so, cocking his hat fiercely, he marched out of the room without making any excuse, or any one daring to make the least demand. End of Book 2, Chapter 4 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Book 2, Chapter 5 Of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, the Great This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great, by Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Five, containing many surprising adventures, which our hero, with great greatness, achieved. We will now leave our hero to take a short repose and return to Mr. Snap's, where, at Wilde's departure, the fair Theodosia had again betaken herself to her stocking, and Miss Letty had retired upstairs to Mr. Bagshot. But that gentleman had broken his parole, and having conveyed himself below stairs, behind a door, he took the opportunity of Wilde's sally to make his escape. We shall only observe that Miss Letty's surprise was the greater as she had, notwithstanding her promise to the contrary, taken the precaution to turn the key, but in her hurry she did it ineffectually. How wretched must have been the situation of this young creature, who had not only lost a lover on whom her tender heart perfectly doted, but was exposed to the rage of an injured father, tenderly jealous of his honour, which was deeply engaged to the sheriff of London and Middlesex for the safe custody of the said bagshot, and for which two very good responsible friends had given not only their words, but their bonds. But let us remove our eyes from this melancholy object, and survey our hero, who, after a successless search for Miss Straddle, with wonderful greatness of mind and steadiness of countenance, went early in the morning to visit his friend Hartfree, at a time when the common herd of friends would have forsaken and avoided him. He entered the room with a cheerful air, which he presently changed into surprise on seeing his friend in a nightgown, with his wounded head bound about with linen, 
and looking extremely pale from a great effusion of blood. When Wilde was informed by Hartfree what had happened, he first expressed great sorrow, and afterwards suffered as violent agonies of rage against the robbers to burst from him. Hartfree, in compassion to the deep impression his misfortunes seemed to make on his friend, endeavoured to lessen it as much as possible, at the same time exaggerating the obligation he owed to Wilde, in which his wife likewise seconded him, and they breakfasted with more comfort than was reasonably to be expected after such an accident. Hartfree expressing great satisfaction that he had put the Count's note in another pocket-book, adding that such a loss would have been fatal to him. For, to confess the truth to you, my dear friend, said he, I have had some losses lately, which have greatly perplexed my affairs, and though I have many debts due to me from people of great fashion, I assure you I know not where to be certain of getting a shilling. Wilde greatly felicitated him on the lucky accident of preserving his note, and then proceeded, with much acrimony, to inveigh against the barbarity of people of fashion who kept tradesmen out of their money. While they amused themselves with discourses of this kind, Wilde, meditating within himself, whether he should borrow or steal from his friend, or, indeed, whether he could not affect both, the apprentice brought a banknote of five hundred pounds in to Hartfree, which he said a gentlewoman in the shop, who had been looking at some jewels, desired him to exchange. Hartfree, looking at the number, immediately recollected it to be one of those he had been robbed of. With this discovery he acquainted Wilde, who, with the notable presence of mind and unchanged complexion, so essential to a great character, advised him to proceed cautiously, and offered, as Mr. Hartfree himself was, he said, too much flustered to examine the woman with sufficient art, to take her into a room in his house alone. He would, he said, personate the master of the shop, would pretend to show her some jewels, and would undertake to get sufficient information out of her to secure the rogues, and most probably all their booty. This proposal was readily and thankfully accepted by Hartfree. Wilde went immediately upstairs into the room appointed, whither the apprentice, according to appointment, conducted the lady. The apprentice was ordered downstairs the moment the lady entered the room, and Wilde, having shut the door, approached her with great ferocity in his looks, and began to expatiate on the complicated baseness of the crime she had been guilty of. But, though he uttered many good lessons of morality, as we doubt whether from a particular reason they may work any very good effect on our reader, we shall omit his speech and only mention his conclusion, which was by asking her what mercy she could now expect from him. Miss Straddle, for that was the young lady, who had had a good education, and had been more than once present at the Old Bailey, very confidently denied the whole charge, and said she had received the note from a friend. Wilde, then, raising his voice, told her she should be immediately committed, and she might depend on being convicted. But, added he, changing his tone, as I have a violent affection for thee, my dear Straddle, if you will follow my advice, I promise you on my honour to forgive you, nor shall you be ever called in question on this account. Why, 
"'What would you have me do, Mr. Wilde?' replied the young lady, with a pleasanter aspect. "'You must know, then,' said Wilde, "'the money you picked out of my pocket. "'Nay, by G blank D, you did, "'and if you offer to flinch you shall be convicted of it. "'I won at play of a fellow who, it seems, "'robbed my friend of it. "'You must, therefore, give an information on oath against one Thomas Fierce, and say that you receive the note from him, and leave the rest to me. I am certain, Molly, you must be sensible of your obligations to me, who return good for evil to you in this manner. The lady readily consented, and advanced to embrace Mr. Wilde, who stepped a little back and cried, Hold, Molly! There are two other notes of two hundred pounds each to be accounted for. Where are they? The lady protested, with the most solemn asseverations, that she knew of no more, with which, when Wilde was not satisfied, she cried, I will stand search. That you shall, answered Wilde, and stand strip, too. He then proceeded to tumble and search her, but to no purpose till, at last, she burst into tears, and declared she would tell the truth, as, indeed, she did. She then confessed that she had disposed of the one to Jack Swagger, a great favourite of the ladies, being an Irish gentleman who had been bred clerk to an attorney, afterwards whipped out of a regiment of dragoons, and was then a Newgate solicitor and a body-house bully, and, as for the other, she had laid it all out that very morning in brocaded silks and Flanders lace. With this account, Wilde, who indeed knew it to be a very probable one, was forced to be contented, and now, abandoning all further thoughts of what he saw was irretrievably lost, he gave the lady some further instructions and then, desiring her to stay a few minutes behind him, he returned to his friend, and acquainted him that he had discovered the whole roguery, that the woman had confessed from whom she had received the note, and promised to give an information before a justice of peace, adding he was concerned he could not attend him thither, being obliged to go to the other end of the town to receive thirty pounds, which he was to pay that evening. Hartfree said that should not prevent him of his company, for he could easily lend him such a trifle. This was accordingly done and accepted, and Wilde, Hartfree, and the lady went to the justice together. The warrant being granted, and the constable being acquainted by the lady, who received her information from Wilde, of Mr. Fierce's haunts, he was easily apprehended, and being confronted by Miss Straddle, who swore positively to him, though she had never seen him before, he was committed to Newgate, where he immediately conveyed an information to Wilde of what had happened, and, in the evening, received a visit from him. Wilde affected great concern for his friend's misfortune, and as great surprise at the means by which it was brought about. However, he told Fierce that he must certainly be mistaken in that point of his having had no acquaintance with Miss Straddle, but added that he would find her out, and endeavour to take off her evidence which, he observed, did not come home enough to endanger him. Besides, he would secure him witnesses of an alibi, and five or six, to his character, so that he need be under no apprehension, for his confinement till the sessions would be his only punishment. Fierce, who was greatly comforted by these assurances of his friend, returned him many thanks and both shaking each other very earnestly by the hand, with a very hearty embrace, they separated. 
the hero considered with himself that the single evidence of Miss Straddle would not be sufficient to convict Fierce, whom he resolved to hang, as he was the person who had principally refused to deliver him the stipulated share of the booty. He therefore went in quest of Mr. James Sly, the gentleman who had assisted in the exploit, and found and acquainted him with the apprehending of Fierce, Wild, then, intimating his fear, lest Fierce should impeach Sly, advised him to be beforehand, to surrender himself to a justice of peace, and offer himself as an evidence. Sly approved Mr. Wild's opinion, went directly to a magistrate, and was by him committed to the gatehouse, with a promise of being admitted to evidence against his companion. Fierce was in a few days brought to his trial at the Old Bailey, where, to his great confusion, his old friend Sly appeared against him, as did Miss Straddle. His only hopes were now in the assistances which our hero had promised him. These unhappily failed him, so that the evidence being plain against him, and he making no defence, the jury convicted him, the court condemned him, and Mr. Ketch executed him. With such infinite address did this truly great man know how to play with the passions of men, to set them at variance with each other, and to work his own purposes out of those jealousies and apprehensions which he was wonderfully ready at creating by means of those great arts which the vulgar call treachery, dissembling, promising, lying, falsehood, etc., but which are by great men summed up in the collective name of policy, or politics, or rather politrix, an art of which, as it is the highest excellence of human nature, Perhaps our great man was the most eminent master. End of Book 2, Chapter 5 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Book Two, Chapter Six of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great, by Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Six, of Hats. Wild had now got together a very considerable gang composed of undone gamesters, ruined bailiffs, broken tradesmen, idle apprentices, attorneys, clerks, and loose and disorderly youth, who, being born to no fortune, nor bred to any trade or profession, were willing to live luxuriously without labor. As these persons wore different principles, that is, hats, frequent dissensions grew among them there were particularly two parties viz those who wore hats fiercely cocked and those who preferred the nab or trencher hat with the brim flapping over their eyes the former were called cavaliers and tory rory ranter boys etc the latter went by the several names of wags roundheads, shake-bags, old nowls, and several others. Between these, continual jars arose, insomuch that they grew in time to think there was something essential in their differences, and that their interests were incompatible with each other, whereas, in truth, 
the difference lay only in the fashion of their hats. Wild, therefore, having assembled them all at an alehouse on the night after Fierce's execution, and perceiving evident marks of their misunderstanding from their behavior to each other, addressed them in the following gentle but forcible manner. Footnote. There is something very mysterious in this speech, which probably that chapter written by Aristotle on this subject, which is mentioned by a French author, might have given some light into, but that is unhappily among the lost works of that philosopher. It is remarkable that Galerus, which is Latin for a hat, signifies, likewise, a dogfish, as the Greek word cunie doth the skin of that animal, of which I suppose the hats or helmets of the ancients were composed, as ours at present are of the beaver or rabbit. Sophocles, in the latter end of his Ajax, alludes to a method of cheating in hats, and the scholiast on the place tells us of one Crifantes, who was a master of the art. It is observable, likewise, that Achilles, in the first Iliad of Homer, tells Agamemnon, in anger, that he had dog's eyes. Now, as the eyes of a dog are handsomer than those of almost any other animal, this could be no term of reproach. He must, therefore, mean that he had a hat on, which, perhaps from the creature it was made of, or from some other reason, might have been a mark of infamy. This superstitious opinion may account for that custom, which hath descended through all nations, of showing respect by pulling off this covering, and that no man is esteemed fit to converse with his superiors with it on. I shall conclude this learned note with remarking that the term old hat is at present used by the vulgar in no very honourable sense. Gentlemen, I am ashamed to see men embarked in so great and glorious an undertaking as that of robbing the public, so foolishly and weakly dissenting among themselves. Do you think the first inventors of hats or at least of the distinctions between them, really conceive that one form of hats should inspire a man with divinity, another with law, another with learning, or another with bravery. No, they meant no more by these outward signs than to impose on the vulgar, and instead of putting great men to the trouble of acquiring or maintaining the substance to make it sufficient that they condescend to wear the type or shadow of it. You do wisely, therefore, when, in a crowd, to amuse the mob by quarrels on such accounts, that while they are listening to your jargon, you may with the greater ease and safety pick their pockets. But surely to be in earnest, and privately to keep up such a ridiculous contention among yourselves, must argue the highest folly and absurdity. When you know you are all prigs, what difference can a broad or a narrow brim create? Is a prig less a prig in one hat than in another? If the public should be weak enough to interest themselves in your quarrels, and to prefer one pack to the other, while both are aiming at their purses, it is your business to laugh at, not imitate their folly. What can be more ridiculous than for gentlemen to quarrel about hats, when there is not one among you whose hat is worth a farthing? What is the use of a hat, farther than to keep the head warm, or to hide a bald crown from the public? It is the mark of a gentleman to move his hat on every occasion, and in courts and noble assemblies no man ever wears one. Let me hear no more, therefore, of this childish disagreement, but all toss up your hats together with one accord, and consider that hat as the best which will contain 
the largest booty. He thus ended his speech, which was followed by a murmuring applause, and immediately all present tossed their hats together as he had commanded them. End of Book 2, Chapter 6 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Book 2, Chapter 7 Of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great, by Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Seven. Showing the consequence which attended Hartfree's adventures with Wilde, all natural and common enough to little wretches who deal with great men, together with some precedents of letters being the different methods of answering a dun. Let us now return to Hartfree, to whom the Count's note, which he had paid away, was returned, with an account that the drawer was not to be found, and that, on inquiring after him, they had heard he had run away, and, consequently, the money was now demanded of the endorser. The apprehension of such a loss would have affected any man of business, but much more one whose unavoidable ruin it must prove. He expressed so much concern and confusion on this occasion that the proprietor of the note was frightened and resolved to lose no time in securing what he could, so that in the afternoon of the same day Mr. Snap was commissioned to pay Hartfree a visit, which he did with his usual formality, and conveyed him to his own house. Mrs. Hartfree was no sooner informed of what had happened to her husband than she raved like one distracted, but after she had vented the first agonies of her passion in tears and lamentations, she applied herself to all possible means to procure her husband's liberty. She hastened to beg her neighbors to secure bail for him, but as the news had arrived at their houses before her, she found none of them at home, except an honest Quaker, whose servants durst not tell a lie. However, she succeeded no better with him, for, unluckily, he had made an affirmation the day before that he would never be bail for any man. After many fruitless efforts of this kind, she repaired to her husband to comfort him at least with her presence. She found him sealing the last of several letters which he was dispatching to his friends and creditors. The moment he saw her, a sudden joy sparkled in his eyes, which however, had a very short duration, for despair soon closed them again, nor could he help bursting into some passionate expressions of concern for her and his little family, which she, on her part, did her utmost to lessen, by endeavouring to mitigate the loss, and to raise in him hopes from the Count, who might, she said, be possibly only gone into the country." She comforted him, likewise, with the expectation of favour from his acquaintance, especially from those whom he had in a particular manner obliged and served. Lastly, she conjured him, by all the value and esteem he professed for her, not to endanger his health, on which alone depended her happiness, by too great an indulgence of grief assuring him that no state of life could appear unhappy to her with him, unless his own sorrow or discontent made it so. 
In this manner did this weak, poor, spirited woman attempt to relieve her husband's pains, which it would have rather become her to aggravate by not only painting out his misery in the liveliest colours imaginable, but by upbraiding him with that folly and confidence which had occasioned it, and by lamenting her own hard fate in being obliged to share his sufferings. Heartfree returned this goodness, as it is called, of his wife with the warmest gratitude, and they passed an hour in a scene of tenderness, too low and contemptible to be recounted to our great readers. We shall, therefore, omit all such relations, as they tend only to make human nature low and ridiculous. Those messengers who had obtained any answers to his letters now returned. We shall here copy a few of them, as they may serve for precedence to others who have an occasion, which happens commonly enough in genteel life, to answer the impertinence of a dun. Letter 1. Mr. Hartfree, my lord commands me to tell you he is very much surprised at your assurance in asking for money which you know hath been so little while due. However, as he intends to deal no longer at your shop, he hath ordered me to pay you as soon as I shall have cash in hand, which, considering many disbursements for bills long due, etc., can't possibly promise any time, etc., at present, and am your humble servant, Roger Moorcraft. Letter 2. Dear Sir, the money, as you truly say, hath been three years due, but upon my soul I am at present incapable of paying a farthing. But, as I doubt not, very shortly, not only to content that small bill, but likewise to lay out very considerable further sums at your house, hope you will meet with no inconvenience by this short delay in, dear sir, your most sincere, humble servant, Charles Courtley. Letter 3 Mr. Hartfree, I beg you would not acquaint my husband of the trifling debt between us, for, as I know you to be a very good-natured man, I will trust you with a secret. He gave me the money long since to discharge it, which I had the ill luck to lose at play. You may be assured I will satisfy you the first opportunity, and am, sir, your very humble servant, Catherine Rubbers. Please to present my compliments to Mrs. Hartfree. Letter 4. Mr. Thomas Hartfree, sir. Yours received. But as to some mention therein, doth not suit at present. Your humble servant, Peter Pounce. Letter 5. Sir, I am sincerely sorry it is not at present possible for me to comply with your request especially after so many obligations received on my side, of which I shall always entertain the most grateful memory. I am very greatly concerned at your misfortunes, and would have waited upon you in person, but am not at present very well, <coughs> and besides am obliged to go this evening to Vauxhall. I am, sir, your most obliged humble servant, Charles Easy. P.S. I hope good Mrs. Hartfree and the dear little ones are well. There were more letters to much the same purpose, but we proposed giving our readers a taste only. Of all these, the last was infinitely the most grating to poor Hartfree, as it came from one to whom when in distress he had himself lent a considerable sum, and of whose present flourishing circumstances he was well assured.
End of Book Two, Chapter Six. Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Book Two, Chapter Eight of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. By Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Eight, in which our hero carries greatness to an immoderate height. Let us remove, therefore, as fast as we can, this detestable picture of ingratitude, and present the much more agreeable portrait of that assurance to which the French very properly annex the epithet of good. Hartfree had scarce done reading his letters when our hero appeared before his eyes, not with that aspect which a pitiful parson meets his patron after having opposed him at an election, or which a doctor wears when sneaking away from a door when he is informed of his patient's death, not with that downcast countenance which betrays the man who, after a strong conflict between virtue and vice, hath surrendered his mind to the latter, and is discovered in his first treachery. But with that noble, bold, great confidence with which a prime minister assures his dependent that the place he promised him was disposed of before. And such concern and uneasiness as he expresses in his looks on those occasions did Wilde testify on the first meeting of his friend. And as the said prime minister chides you for neglect of your interest, in not having asked in time, so did our hero attack Hartfree for his giving credit to the Count, and, without suffering him to make any answer, proceeded in a torrent of words to overwhelm him with abuse, which, however friendly its intention might be, was scarce to be outdone by an enemy. By these means, Hartfree, who might perhaps otherwise have vented some little concern for that recommendation which Wilde had given him to the Count, was totally prevented from any such endeavour, and, like an invading prince, when attacked in his own dominions, forced to recall his whole strength to defend himself at home. This, indeed, he did so well, by insisting on the figure and outward appearance of the Count and his equipage, that Wilde at length grew a little more gentle, and with a sigh said, I confess I have the least reason of all mankind to censure another for an imprudence of this nature, as I am myself the most easy to be imposed upon, and indeed have been so by this Count, who, if he be insolvent, hath cheated me of five hundred pounds. But for my own part, said he, I will not despair, nor would I have you. Many men have found it convenient to retire or abscond for a while, and afterwards have paid their debts, or at least handsomely compounded them. This I am certain of, should a composition take place, which is the worst, I think, that can be apprehended, I shall be the only loser, for I shall think myself obliged, in honour, to repair your loss, even though you must confess it was principally owing to your own folly. Z blank 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 D S. Had I imagined it necessary, I would have cautioned you, but I thought the part of the town where he lived sufficient caution not to trust him, and such a sum, 
the devil must have been in you, certainly. This was a degree of impudence beyond poor Mrs. Hartfree's imagination, though she had before vented the most violent execrations on Wilde, she was now thoroughly satisfied of his innocence, and begged him not to insist any longer on what he perceived so deeply affected her husband. She said trade could not be carried on without credit, and surely he was sufficiently justified in giving it to such a person as the Count appeared to be. Besides, she said, reflections on what was past and irretrievable would be of little service, that their present business was to consider how to prevent the evil consequences which threatened, and first to endeavour to procure her husband his liberty. Why doth he not procure bail? said Wild. Alas, sir, said she, we have applied to many of our acquaintance in vain. We have met with excuses even where we could least expect them. Not bail, answered Wilde, in a passion. He shall have bail, if there is any in the world. It is now very late, but trust me to procure him bail to-morrow morning. Mrs. Hartfree received these professions with tears, and told Wild he was a friend indeed. She then proposed to stay that evening with her husband, but he would not permit her on account of his little family, whom he would not agree to trust to the care of servants in this time of confusion. A hackney coach was then sent for, but without success, for these, like hackney friends, always offer themselves in the sunshine, but are never to be found when you want them. And as for a chair, Mr. Snap lived in a part of the town which chairmen very little frequent. The good woman was therefore obliged to walk home, whither the gallant Wilde offered to attend her as a protector. This favor was thankfully accepted, and the husband and wife, having taken a tender leave of each other, the former was locked in, and the latter locked out by the hands of Mr. Snap himself. As this visit of Mr. Wilde's to Hartfree may seem one of those passages in history which writers, drunkenser like introduce only because they dare. Indeed, as it may seem somewhat contradictory to the greatness of our hero, and may tend to blemish his character with an imputation of that kind of friendship which savours too much of weakness and imprudence, it may be necessary to account for this visit, especially to our more sagacious readers, whose satisfaction we shall always consult in the most especial manner. They are to know, then, that at the first interview with Mrs. Hartfree, Mr. Wilde had conceived that passion, or affection, or friendship, or desire, for that handsome creature, which the gentlemen of this our age agreed to call love, and which is indeed no other than that kind of affection which, after the exercise of the dominical day is over, a lusty divine is apt to conceive for the well-dressed sirloin, or handsome buttock, which the well-edified squire, in gratitude, sets before him, and which, so violent is his love, he devours in imagination the moment he sees it. Not less ardent was the hungry passion of our hero, who, from the moment he had cast his eyes on that charming dish, had cast about in his mind by what method he might come at it. This, as he perceived, might most easily be effected after the ruin of Hartfree, which, for other considerations, he had intended. So 
he postponed all endeavours for this purpose till he had first effected that by order of time was regularly to precede this latter design with such regularity did this our hero conduct all his schemes and so truly superior was he to all the efforts of passion which so often disconcert and disappoint the noblest views of others end of book two chapter eight read by dennis sayers in modesto california for librivox Book Two, Chapter Nine of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, the Great, by Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Nine. More greatness in Wilde. A low scene between Mrs. Hartfree and her children, and. A scheme of our hero, worthy the highest admiration, and even astonishment. When first Wilde conducted his flame, or rather his dish, to continue our metaphor, from the proprietor, he had projected a design of conveying her to one of those eating-houses in Covent Garden, where female flesh is deliciously dressed and served up to the greedy appetites of young gentlemen but fearing lest she should not come readily enough into his wishes and that by too eager and hasty a pursuit he should frustrate his future expectations and luckily at the same time a noble hint suggesting itself to him by which he might almost inevitably secure his pleasure together with his profit he contented himself with waiting on mrs hartfree home and after many protestations of friendship and service to her husband took his leave and promised to visit her early in the morning and to conduct her back to mr snap's wilde now retired to a night cellar where he found several of his acquaintance with whom he spent the remaining part of the night in revelling nor did the least compassion for hartfree's misfortunes disturb the pleasure of his cups so truly great was his soul that it was absolutely composed save that an apprehension of miss tishy's making some discovery as she was then in no good temper towards him a little ruffled and disquieted the perfect serenity he would otherwise have enjoyed as he had therefore no opportunity of seeing her that evening he wrote her a letter full of ten thousand protestations of honourable love and which he more depended on containing as many promises in order to bring the young lady into good humour without acquainting her in the least with his suspicion or giving her any caution for it was his constant maxim never to put it into any one's head to do you a mischief by acquainting him that it is in his power we must now return to mrs hartfree who passed a sleepless night in as great agonies and horror for the absence of her husband as a fine well-bred woman would feel at the return of hers from a long voyage or journey in the morning the children being brought to her the eldest asked where dear papa was at which she could not refrain from bursting into tears the child perceiving it said don't cry mamma i am sure papa would not stay abroad if he could help it at these words she caught the child in her arms and throwing herself into the chair in an agony of passion cried out no my child nor shall all the malice of hell keep us long asunder these are circumstances which 
we should not, for the amusement of six or seven readers only, have inserted, had they not served to show that there are weaknesses in vulgar life to which great minds are so entirely strangers that they have not even an idea of them, and secondly, by exposing the folly of this low creature to set off and elevate that greatest of which we endeavor to draw a true portrait in this history. Wild, entering the room, found the mother with one child in her arms, and the other at her knee. After paying her his compliments, he desired her to dismiss the children and servant, for that he had something of the greatest moment to impart to her. She immediately complied with his request, and, the door being shut, asked him with great eagerness if he had succeeded in his intentions of procuring the bail. He answered he had not endeavoured at it yet, for a scheme had entered into his head by which she might certainly preserve her husband, herself, and her family, in order to which he advised her instantly to remove with the most valuable jewels she had to Holland, before any statute of bankruptcy issued to prevent her, that he would himself attend her thither and place her in safety, and then return to deliver her husband, who would be thus easily able to satisfy his creditors. He added that he was that instant come from Snaps, where he had communicated the scheme to Hartfree, who had greatly approved of it, and desired her to put it in execution without delay, concluding that a moment was not to be lost. The mention of her husband's approbation left no doubt in this poor woman's breast. She only desired a moment's time to pay him a visit in order to take her leave. But Wilde preemptorily refused. He said by every moment's delay she risked the ruin of her family, that she would be absent only a few days from him, for that the moment he had lodged her safe in Holland, he would return, procure her husband his liberty, and bring him to her. I have been the unfortunate, the innocent cause of all my dear Tom's calamity, madam, said he, and I will perish with him, or see him out of it. Mrs. Hartfree overflowed with acknowledgments of his goodness, but still begged for the shortest interview with her husband. Wilde declared that a minute's delay might be fatal, and added, though with the voice of sorrow rather than of anger, that if she had not resolution enough to execute the commands he brought her from her husband, his ruin would lie at her door, and, for his own part, he must give up any farther meddling in his affairs. She then proposed to take her children with her, but Wilde would not permit it, saying they would only retard their flight, and that it would be properer for her husband to bring them. He at length absolutely prevailed on this poor woman, who immediately packed up the most valuable effects she could find, and after taking a tender leave of her infants, earnestly recommended them to the care of a very faithful servant. Then they called a hackney coach, which conveyed them to an inn, where they were furnished with a chariot and six, in which they set forward for Harwich. Wild rode with an exulting heart, secure, as he now thought himself, of the possession of that lovely woman, together with a rich cargo. In short, he enjoyed in his mind all the happiness which unbridled lust and rapacious avarice could promise him. As to the poor creature who was to satisfy these passions, her whole soul was employed in reflecting on the condition of her husband and children. A single word scarce escaped her lips, though many a tear gushed from her brilliant eyes, which, if I may use a coarse expression, 
served only as delicious sauce to heighten the appetite of wild. End of Book 2, Chapter 9 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Book 2, Chapter 10 Of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild, The Great By Henry Fielding Book 2, Chapter 10 Sea Adventures, Very New and Surprising When they arrived at Harwich, they found a vessel, which had put in there, just ready to depart for Rotterdam. So they went immediately on board, and sailed with a fair wind, but they had hardly proceeded out of sight of land, when a sudden and violent storm arose, and drove them to the southwest, insomuch that the captain apprehended it impossible to avoid the Goodwin Sands, and he and all his crew gave themselves up for lost. Mrs. Hartfree who had no other apprehensions from death but those of leaving her dear husband and children, fell on her knees to beseech the Almighty's favour, when Wilde, with a contempt of danger truly great, took a resolution as worthy to be admired, perhaps, as any recorded of the bravest hero, ancient or modern. A resolution which plainly proved him to have these two qualifications so necessary to a hero, to be superior to all the energies of fear or pity. He saw the tyrant death ready to rescue from him his intended prey, which he had yet devoured only in imagination. He therefore swore he would prevent him, and immediately attacked the poor wretch, who was in the utmost agonies of despair, first with solicitation, and afterwards with force. Mrs. Hartfree, the moment she understood his meaning, which in her present temper of mind, and in the opinion she held of him, she did not immediately, rejected him with all the repulses which indignation and horror could animate. But when he attempted violence, she filled the cabin with her shrieks, which were so vehement that they reached the ears of the captain, the storm at this time luckily abating. This man, who was a brute rather from his education and the element he inhabited than from nature, ran hastily down to her assistance, and, finding her struggling on the ground with our hero, he presently rescued her from her intended ravisher who was soon obliged to quit the woman, in order to engage with her lusty champion, who spared neither pains nor blows in the assistance of his fair passenger. When the short battle was over, in which our hero, had he not been overpowered with numbers, who came down on their captain's side, would have been victorious, the captain rapped out a hearty oath, and asked wild, if he had no more Christianity in him than to ravish a woman in a storm, to which the other greatly and sullenly answered, it was very well, but d blank blank him if he had not satisfaction the moment they came on shore. The captain, with great scorn, replied, kiss, blank, blank, etc., and then, forcing Wilde out of the cabin, he, at Mrs. Hartfree's request, locked her into it, and returned to the care of his ship. The storm was now entirely ceased, and nothing remained but the usual ruffling of the sea after it, when one of the sailors spied a sail at a distance, which the captain wisely apprehended might be a privateer, 
for we were then engaged in a war with France, and immediately ordered all the sail possible to be crowded. But his caution was in vain, for the little wind which then blew was directly adverse, so that the ship bore down upon them, and soon appeared to be what the captain had feared, a French privateer. He was in no condition of resistance, and immediately struck on her firing the first gun. The captain of the Frenchman, with several of his hands, came on board the English vessel, which they rifled of everything valuable, and, amongst the rest, of poor Mrs. Hartfree's whole cargo, and then, taking the crew, together with the two passengers, aboard his own ship, he determined, as the other would be only a burthen to him, to sink her, she being very old and leaky, and not worth going back with to Dunkirk. He preserved, therefore, nothing but the boat, as his own was none of the best, and then, pouring a broadside into her, he sent her to the bottom. The French captain, who was a very young fellow, and a man of gallantry, was presently enamoured, to no small degree, with his beautiful captive, and, imagining Wilde, from some words he dropped, to be her husband, notwithstanding the ill affection towards him which appeared in her looks, he asked her if she understood French. She answered in the affirmative, for indeed she did perfectly well. He then asked her how long she and that gentleman, pointing to Wilde, had been married. She answered, with a deep sigh and many tears, that she was married indeed, but not to that villain who was the sole cause of all her misfortunes. That appellation raised a curiosity in the captain, and he importuned her in so pressing but gentle a manner to acquaint him with the injuries she complained of, that she was at last prevailed on to recount to him the whole history of her afflictions. This so moved the captain, who had two little notions of greatness, and so incensed him against our hero, that he resolved to punish him, and without regard to the laws of war, he immediately ordered out his shattered boat, and making Wilde a present of half a dozen biscuits to prolong his misery, he put him therein, and then, committing him to the mercy of the sea, proceeded on his cruise. End of Book 2, Chapter 10 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Book 2, Chapter 11 of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great by Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Eleven. The Great and Wonderful Behavior of Our Hero in the Boat. It is probable that a desire of ingratiating himself with his charming captive, or rather conqueror, had no little share in promoting this extraordinary act of illegal justice, for the Frenchman had conceived the same sort of passion, or hunger, which Wilde himself had felt, and was almost as much resolved, by some means or other, to satisfy it. We will leave him, however, at present, in the pursuit of his wishes, and attend our hero in his boat since it is in circumstances of distress that true greatness appears most wonderful. For that a prince in the midst of his courtiers, all ready to compliment him with his favourite character or title, and indeed with everything else, or that a conqueror at the head of a hundred thousand men, all prepared to execute his will, how ambitious, wanton, or cruel soever, should, 
in the giddiness of their pride, elevate themselves many degrees above those their tools, seems not difficult to be imagined, or indeed accounted for. But that a man in chains, in prison, nay, in the vilest dungeon, should, with persevering pride and obstinate dignity, discover that vast superiority in his own nature over the rest of mankind, who, to a vulgar eye, seem much happier than himself, nay, that he should discover heaven and providence, whose peculiar care, it seems, he is, at that very time, at work for him. This is among the arcana of greatness, to be perfectly understood only by an adept in that science. What could be imagined more miserable than the situation of our hero at this season, floating in a little boat on the open seas, without oar, without sail, and at the mercy of the first wave to overwhelm him? Nay, this was indeed the fair side of his fortune, as it was a much more eligible fate than that alternative which threatened him with almost unavoidable certainty, viz. starving with hunger, the sure consequence of a continuance of the calm. Our hero, finding himself in this condition, began to ejaculate a round of blasphemies, which the reader, without being over-pious, might be offended at seeing repeated. He then accused the whole female sex, and the passion of love, as he called it, particularly that which he bore to Mrs. Hartfree, as the unhappy occasion of his present sufferings. At length, finding himself descending too much into the language of meanness and complaint, he stopped short, and after broke forth as follows. D. Blank Blank in it. A man can die but once. What signifies it? Every man must die, and when it is over, it is over. I never was afraid of anything yet, nor I won't begin now. No, D blank blank in me, won't I? What signifies fear? I shall die whether I am afraid or no. Who's afraid then, D blank blank in me? At which words he looked extremely fierce, but, recollecting that no one was present to see him, he relaxed a little the terror on his countenance, and, pausing a while, repeated the word, D blank blank in. Suppose I should be D blank blank in at last, cries he, when I never thought a syllable of the matter. I have often laughed and made a jest about it. And yet it may be so, for anything which I know to the contrary. If there should be another world, it will go hard with me, that is certain. I shall never escape for what I have done to Hartfree. The devil must have me for that, undoubtedly. The devil! Pshaw! I am not such a fool to be frightened at him neither. No, no, when a man's dead there's an end of him. I wish I was certainly satisfied of it, though, for there are some men of learning, as I have heard, of a different opinion. It is but a bad chance, methinks, I stand. If there be no other world, why, I shall be in no worse condition than a block or a stone. But if there should, d blank blank in me, I will think no longer about it. Let a pack of cowardly rascals be afraid of death. I dare look him in the face. But shall I stay and be starved? No. I will eat up the biscuits the French son of a whore bestowed on me, and then leap into the sea for drink, since the unconscionable dog hath not allowed me a single dram. Having thus said, he proceeded immediately to put his purpose in execution, and, as his resolution never failed him, he had no sooner dispatched the small quantity of provision which his enemy had with no vast liberality presented him, 
Then he cast himself headlong into the sea. End of Book 2, Chapter 11 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Book 2, Chapter 12 Of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great This LibriVox recording is in the public domain read by dennis sayers the late mr jonathan wild the great by henry fielding book two chapter twelve the strange and yet natural escape of our hero our hero having with wonderful resolution thrown himself into the sea as we mentioned at the end of the last chapter was miraculously within two minutes after replaced in his boat, and this without the assistance of a dolphin, or a seahorse, or any other fish or animal, who are always as ready at hand, when a poet or historian pleases to call for them, to carry a hero through the sea, as any chairman at a coffee-house door near St. James, to convey a bow over a street, and preserve his white stockings. The truth is, we do not choose to have any recourse to miracles from the strict observance we pay to that rule of Horace, Nec Deus intersit, nisi dignus vindice nodus, the meaning of which is, do not bring in a supernatural agent when you can do without him. And indeed, we are much deeper read in natural than supernatural causes. We will, therefore, endeavour to account for this extraordinary event from the former of these, and in doing this it will be necessary to disclose some profound secrets to our reader, extremely well worth his knowing, and which may serve him to account for many occurrences of the phenomenous kind which have formerly appeared in this our hemisphere. Be it known, then, that the great alma mater, nature, is of all other females the most obstinate and tenacious of her purpose. So true is that observation, Naturum expellus furca liset usque recurret, which I need not render in English, it being to be found in a book which most fine gentlemen are forced to read. Whatever nature, therefore, purposes to herself, she never suffers any reason, design, or accident to frustrate. Now, though it may seem to a shallow observer that some persons were designed by nature for no use or purpose whatever, yet certain it is that no man is born into the world without his particular allotment, viz. some to be kings, some statesmen, some ambassadors, some bishops, some generals, and so on. Of these there be two kinds, those to whom nature is so generous to give some endowment, qualifying them for the parts she intends them afterwards to act on this stage, and those whom she uses as instances of her unlimited power and for whose preferment to such and such stations Solomon himself could have invented no other reason than that nature designed them so. These latter some great philosophers have, to show them to be the favorites of nature, distinguished by the honorable appellation of naturals. Indeed, the true reason of the general ignorance of mankind on this head seems to be this, that as nature chooses to execute these her purposes by certain second causes, and as many of the second causes seem so totally foreign to her design, the wit of man, which, like his eye, sees best directly forward, 
and very little and imperfectly what is oblique, is not able to discern the end by the means. Thus, how a handsome wife or daughter should contribute to execute her original designation of a general, or how flattery or half a dozen houses in a borough town should denote a judge or a bishop, he is not capable of comprehending. And indeed we ourselves, wise as we are, are forced to reason ab effectu. And if we had been asked what nature had intended such men for, before she herself had, by the event, demonstrated her purpose, it is possible we might sometimes have been puzzled to declare. For it must be confessed that at first sight, and to a mind uninspired, a man of vast natural capacity and much acquired knowledge may seem by nature designed for power and honour, rather than one remarkable only for the want of these, and indeed all other qualifications. Whereas daily experience convinces us of the contrary, and drives us, as it were, into the opinion I have here disclosed. Now, nature having originally intended our great man for that final exultation, which, as it is the most proper and becoming end of all great men, it were heartily to be wished they might all arrive at, would by no means be diverted from her purpose. She therefore no sooner spied him in the water than she softly whispered in his ear to attempt the recovery of his boat, which call he immediately obeyed, and being a good swimmer, and it being a perfect calm, with great facility accomplished it. Thus we think this passage in our history, at first so greatly surprising, is very naturally accounted for, and our relation rescued from the prodigious, which, though it often occurs in biography, is not to be encouraged, nor much commended on any occasion, unless when absolutely necessary to prevent the histories being at an end. Secondly, we hope our hero is justified from that imputation of want of resolution which must have been fatal to the greatness of his character. End of Book 2, Chapter 12, read by Dennis Sayers, in Modesto, California, for LibriVox. Book 2, Chapter 13, of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great. By Henry Fielding. Book Two, Chapter Thirteen. The Conclusion of the Boat Adventure and the End of the Second Book. Our hero passed the remainder of the evening, the night, and the next day in a condition not much to be envied by any passion of the human mind, unless by ambition, which, provided it can only entertain itself with the most distant music of fame's trumpet, can disdain all the pleasures of the sensualist, and those more solemn, though quieter comforts, which a good conscience suggests to a Christian philosopher. He spent his time in contemplation, that is to say, in blaspheming, cursing, and sometimes singing and whistling. At last, when cold and hunger had almost subdued his native fierceness, it being a good deal past midnight and extremely dark, he thought he beheld a light at a distance, which the cloudiness of the sky prevented his mistaking for a star. This light, however, did not seem to approach him, 
at least it approached by such imperceptible degrees that it gave him very little comfort and at length totally forsook him he then renewed his contemplation as before in which he continued till the day began to break when to his inexpressible delight he beheld a sail at a very little distance and which luckily seemed to be making towards him he was likewise soon espied by those in the vessel who wanted no signals to inform them of his distress and as it was almost a calm and their course lay within five hundred yards of him they hoisted out their boat and fetched him aboard the captain of this ship was a frenchman she was laden with deal from norway and had been extremely shattered in the late storm this captain was of that kind of men who are actuated by general humanity and whose compassion can be raised by the distress of a fellow creature though of a nation whose king hath quarrelled with the monarch of their own he therefore commiserating the circumstances of wild who had dressed up a story proper to impose upon such a silly fellow told him that as himself well knew he must be a prisoner on his arrival in france but that he would endeavour to procure his redemption for which our hero greatly thanked him but as they were making very slow sail for they had lost their mainmast in the storm wild saw a little vessel at a distance they being within a few leagues of the english shore which on inquiry he was informed was probably an english fishing boat and it being then perfectly calm he proposed that if they would accommodate him with a pair of scullers he would get within reach of the boat at least near enough to make signals to her and he preferred any risk to the certain fate of being a prisoner as his courage was somewhat restored by the provisions especially brandy with which the frenchman had supplied him he was so earnest in his entreaties that the captain after many persuasions at length complied and he was furnished with scullers and with some bread pork and a bottle of brandy then taking leave of his preservers he again betook himself to his boat and rowed so heartily that he soon came within the sight of the fishermen who immediately made towards him and took him aboard no sooner was wild got safe on board the fisherman than he begged him to make the utmost speed and to deal for that the vessel which was still in sight was a distressed frenchman bound for havre de grace and might easily be made a prize if there was any ship ready to go in pursuit of her so nobly and greatly did our hero neglect all obligations conferred on him by the enemies of his country that he would have contributed all he could to the taking his benefactor to whom he owed both his life and his liberty the fisherman took his advice and soon arrived at deal where the reader will i doubt not be as much concerned as wild was that there was not a single ship prepared to go on the expedition our hero now saw himself once more safe on terra firma but unluckily at some distance from that city where men of ingenuity can most easily supply their wants without the assistance of money or rather can most easily procure money for the supply of their wants however as his talents were superior to every difficulty he framed so dexterous an account of his being a merchant having been taken and plundered by the enemy and of his great effects in london that he was not only heartily regaled by the fishermen at his house but made so handsome a booty by way of borrowing 
a method of taking which we have before mentioned to have his approbation, that he was enabled to provide himself with a place in the stage-coach, which, as God permitted it to perform the journey, brought him at the appointed time to an inn in the metropolis. And now, reader, as thou canst be in no suspense for the fate of our great man, since we have returned him safe to the principal scene of his glory, we will a little look back on the fortunes of Mr. Hartfree, whom we left in no very pleasant situation, but of this we shall treat in the next book. End of Book 2, Chapter 13 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Book 3, Chapter 1 of The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde, The Great this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wild the Great by Henry Fielding. Book Three, Chapter One. The Low and Pitiful Behavior of Hartfree, and the Foolish Conduct of His Apprentice. His misfortunes did not entirely prevent Hartfree from closing his eyes. On the contrary, he slept several hours the first night of his confinement. However, he perhaps paid too severely dear both for his repose and for a sweet dream which accompanied it, and represented his little family in one of those tender scenes which had frequently passed in the days of his happiness and prosperity, when the provision they were making for the future fortunes of their children used to be one of the most agreeable topics of discourse with which he and his wife entertained themselves. The pleasantness of this vision, therefore, served only, on his awaking, to set forth his present misery with additional horror, and to heighten the dreadful ideas which now crowded on his mind. He had spent a considerable time after his first rising from the bed on which he had, without undressing, thrown himself, and now began to wonder at Mrs. Hartfree's long absence. But, as the mind is desirous, and perhaps wisely too, to comfort itself with drawing the most flattering conclusions from all events, so he hoped the longer her stay was, the more certain was his deliverance. At length his impatience prevailed, and he was just going to dispatch a messenger to his own house, when his apprentice came to pay him a visit, and, on his inquiry, informed him that his wife had departed in company with Mr. Wilde many hours before, and had carried all his most valuable effects with her, adding, at the same time, that she had herself positively acquainted him she had her husband's express orders for so doing, and that she was gone to Holland. It is the observation of many wise men, who have studied the anatomy of the soul with more attention than our young physicians generally bestow on that of the body, that great and violent surprise hath a different effect from that which is wrought in a good housewife by perceiving any disorders in her kitchen, who, on such occasions, commonly spreads the disorder, not only over her whole family, but over the whole neighborhood. Now, these calamities, especially when sudden, tend to stifle and deaden all the faculties, instead of rousing them, and, accordingly, Herodotus tells us of a story of Croesus, king of Lydia, who, on beholding his servants and courtiers, led captive, wept bitterly, 
but when he saw his wife and children in that condition, stood stupid and motionless. So stood poor Hartfree on this relation of his apprentice, nothing moving but his colour, which entirely forsook his countenance. The apprentice, who had not in the least doubted the veracity of his mistress, perceiving the surprise which too visibly appeared in his master, became speechless likewise, and both remained silent some minutes, gazing with astonishment and horror at each other. At last, Hartfree cried out in an agony, My wife deserted me in my misfortunes. Heaven forbid, sir, answered the other. And what has become of my poor children? replied Hartfree. They are at home, sir, said the apprentice. Heaven be praised! She hath forsaken them, too, cries Hartfree. Fetch them hither this instant. Go, my dear Jack, bring hither my little all which remains now. Fly, child, if thou dost not intend likewise to forsake me in my afflictions. The youth answered he would die sooner than entertain such a thought, and begging his master to be comforted, instantly obeyed his orders. Hartfree, the moment the young man was departed, threw himself on his bed in an agony of despair. But, recollecting himself after he had vented the first sallies of his passion, he began to question the infidelity of his wife as a matter impossible. He ran over in his thoughts the uninterrupted tenderness which she had always shown him, and, for a minute, blamed the rashness of his belief against her, till the many circumstances of her having left him so long, and neither writ nor sent to him since her departure with all his effects, and with Wilde, of whom he was not before without suspicion, and lastly, and chiefly, her false pretense to his commands, entirely turned the scale, and convinced him of her disloyalty. While he was in these agitations of mind, the good apprentice, who had used the utmost expedition, brought his children to him. He embraced them with the most passionate fondness, and imprinted numberless kisses on their little lips. The little girl flew to him with almost as much eagerness as he himself expressed at her sight, and cried out, Oh, papa, why did you not come home to poor mamma all this while? I thought you would not have left your little Nancy so long. After which he asked her for her mother, and was told she had kissed them both in the morning, and cried very much for his absence all which brought a flood of tears into the eyes of this weak, silly man, who had not greatness sufficient to conquer these low efforts of tenderness and humanity. He then proceeded to inquire of the maid-servant, who acquainted him that she knew no more than that her mistress had taken leave of her children in the morning with many tears and kisses, and had recommended them in the most earnest manner to her care. She said she had promised faithfully to take care of them, and would, while they were entrusted to her, fulfil her promise. For which profession Hartfree expressed much gratitude to her, and, after indulging himself with some little fondnesses which we shall not relate, he delivered his children into the good woman's hands, and dismissed her. End of Book 3, Chapter 1 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox Book three, chapter two, of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. This LibriVox recording 
is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great by Henry Fielding. Book Three, Chapter Two. A soliloquy of Hartfree's, full of low and base ideas, without a syllable of greatness. Being now alone, he sat some short time silent, and then burst forth into the following soliloquy. What shall I do? Shall I abandon myself to a dispirited despair, or fly in the face of the Almighty? Surely both are unworthy of a wise man, for what can be more vain than weakly to lament my fortune, if irretrievable, or, if hope remains, to offend that being who can most strongly support it? But are my passions then voluntary? Am I so absolutely their master that I can resolve with myself? So far only will I grieve. Certainly no. Reason, however we flatter ourselves, hath not such despotic empire in our minds, that it can, with imperial voice, hush all our sorrow in a moment. Where, then, is its use? For either it is an empty sound, and we are deceived in thinking we have reason, or it is given us to some end, and hath a part assigned it by the all-wise Creator. Why, what can its office be other than justly to weigh the worth of all things, and to direct us to that perfection of human wisdom, which proportions our esteem of every object by its real merit, and prevents us from over or undervaluing whatever we hope for, we enjoy, or we lose? It doth not foolishly say to us, Be not glad, or be not sorry, which would be as vain and idle as to bid the purling river cease to run, or the raging wind to blow. It prevents us only from exulting, like children, when we receive a toy, or lamenting when we are deprived of it. Suppose, then, I have lost the enjoyments of this world, and my expectation of future pleasure and profit is for ever disappointed. What relief can my reason afford? What, unless it can show me I had fixed my affections on a toy, that what I desired was not, by a wise man, eagerly to be affected, nor its loss violently deplored, for there are toys adapted to all ages, from the rattle to the throne, and perhaps the value of all is equal to their several possessors. For if the rattle pleases the ear of the infant, what can the flattery of syncophants give more to the prince? The latter is as far from examining into the reality and source of his pleasure as the former, for if they both did, they must both equally despise it. And surely, if we consider them seriously, and compare them together, we shall be forced to conclude all those pomps and pleasures of which men are so fond, and which, through so much danger and difficulty, with such violence and villainy, they pursue, to be as worthless trifles as any exposed to sale in a toy-shop. I have often noted my little girl viewing, with eager eyes, a jointed baby. I have remarked the pains and solicitations she hath used, till I have been prevailed on to indulge her with it. At her first obtaining it, what joy hath sparkled in her countenance! With what raptures hath she taken possession! But how little satisfaction hath she found in it! What pains to work out her amusement from it! Its dress must be varied. The tinsel ornaments which first caught her eyes produce no longer pleasure. She endeavours to make it stand and walk in vain, and is constrained herself to supply it with conversation. In a day's time 
it is thrown by and neglected, and some less costly toy preferred to it. How like the situation of this child is that of every man, what difficulties in the pursuit of his desires, what inanity in the possession of most, and satiety in those which seem more real and substantial. The delights of most men are as childish and as superficial as that of my little girl. A feather or a fiddle are their pursuits and their pleasures through life, even to their ripest years. If such men may be said to attain any ripeness at all. But let us survey those whose understandings are of a more elevated and refined temper. How empty do they soon find the world of enjoyments worth their desire or attaining? How soon do they retreat to solitude and contemplation, to gardening and planting, and such rural amusements, where their trees and they enjoy the air and the sun in common, and both vegetate with very little difference between them. But suppose, which neither truth nor wisdom will allow, we could admit something more valuable and substantial in these blessings, would not the uncertainty of their possession be alone sufficient to lower their price? How mean a tenure is that at the will of fortune, which chance, fraud, and rapine are every day so likely to deprive us of, and often the more likely by how much the greater worth our possessions are of. Is it not to place our affections on a bubble in the water, or on a picture in the clouds? What madman would build a fine house, or frame a beautiful garden, on land in which he held so uncertain an interest? But, again, was all this less undeniable? Did fortune, the lady of our manner, lease to us for our lives, of how little consideration must even this term appear? For, admitting that these pleasures were not liable to be torn from us, how certainly must we be torn from them? Perhaps tomorrow, nay, or even sooner, for as the excellent poet says, where is tomorrow? In the other world. To thousands this is true, and the reverse is to none. But if I have no further hope in this world, can I have none beyond it? Surely those laborious writers, who have taken such infinite pains to destroy or weaken all the proofs of futurity, have not so far succeeded as to exclude us from hope. That active principle in man, which with such boldness pushes us on through every labor and difficulty, to attain the most distant and most improbable event in this world, will not surely deny us a little flattering prospect of those beautiful mansions which, if they could be thought chimerical, must be allowed the loveliest which can entertain the eye of man, and to which the road, if we understand it rightly, appears to have so few thorns and briars in it, and to require so little labor and fatigue from those who shall pass through it, that its ways are truly said to be the ways of pleasantness, and all its paths to be those of peace. If the proofs of Christianity be as strong as I imagine them, surely enough may be deduced from that ground only to comfort and support the most miserable man in his affliction. And this I think my reason tells me, that if the professors and propagators of infidelity are in the right, the losses which death brings to the virtuous are not worth their lamenting. But if these are, as certainly they seem, in the wrong, the blessings it procures them are not sufficiently to be coveted and rejoiced at. On my own account, then, I have no cause for sorrow, 
but on my children's. Why, the same being to whose goodness and power I entrust my own happiness is likewise as able and as willing to procure theirs. Nor matters it what state of life is allotted for them, whether it be their fate to procure bread with their labor, or to eat it at the sweat of others. Perhaps, if we consider the case with proper attention, or resolve it with due sincerity, the former is much the sweeter. The hind may be more happy than the lord, for his desires are fewer, and those such as are attended with more hope and less fear. I will do my utmost to lay the foundations of my children's happiness. I will carefully avoid educating them in a station superior to their fortune, and, for the event, trust to that being in whom whoever rightly confides must be superior to all worldly sorrows. In this low manner did this poor wretch proceed to argue, till he had worked himself up into an enthusiasm which by degrees soon became invulnerable to every human attack, so that when Mr. Snap acquainted him with the return of the writ, and that he must carry him to Newgate, he received the message as Socrates did the news of the ship's arrival, and that he was to prepare for death. 